What was the most expensive thing you ever got for free, because someone made a mistake and didn't charge you? An entire brand new in-store $600 queen mattress. To this day I have no idea what happened with this one. I just moved into my first official place, which I split with my brother. Up to that point I'd slept on a twin my entire life, but having reached what felt like a pinnacle of success, I thought I needed a mattress worthy of my newly independent status. I went to a couple stores where the salesman followed me around and generally creeped me right the heck out. The mattresses were also much more expensive than I'd planned on anyway that I probably would have given up regardless. Well, one day shortly thereafter, I was driving to work when I passed a store that I'd never noticed a closeout sale, I said excitedly to my empty car. Surely there will be something there that I can afford. I beelined over there on my lunch break, unable to wait till after work. It was a tiny shop. Rolled up mattresses were piled in a disorderly heap against the wall inside the door. Beyond them, facing the door, was an equally untidy desk, with papers strewn haphazardly about. To the right was the display floor, which had room for perhaps 8 to 10 mattresses to be out at a time. The middle-aged man behind the desk glanced up over his glasses as I entered. How can I help you? He asked. I'm looking for a memory foam mattress. I'm hoping to find one on the softer side, but I've also heard they can have problems with retaining heat and I want to avoid that. The man nodded and stood, beckoning me over to the first of the eight mattresses on display. This is a really quality one made by, some well-known brand. It does tend to run a bit firm though. I tried it. Yep, this was a papa bear bed. I wanted mama bears. Too soft? No such thing for me. Goldilocks was crazy. The salesman motioned me to the second bed in the line. This one is softer, and it's a really great off-brand bed. With built-in cooling solutions. It's also cheaper by about $200. I sat on the edge, swung my feet up onto the protective cover across the bed, and sank down into utter bliss. This. Was. It. I was astonished by how both squishy and supportive this mattress managed to be. It was like an endless hug from my mom, and I was absolutely sold. Once I managed to pry myself away, we headed over to the clutter pile desk. The man told me my options, cash up front, about $600, or a finance plan, interest free, of three payments, one per month. While I could have paid for it right there, I thought it would be easier on my budget if I didn't totally drain my account unnecessarily. He rummaged around for a while before unearthing the proper paperwork, and filled me in on the story of his doom store while I filled it out. Competition was fierce, he said, and being such a tiny store, he struggled to bring in customers. Add to that that he and his teenage son did all the deliveries, made especially difficult by the fact that his back was starting to go, and he was just done. I'm going back to long-distance trucking, he confided. I've already got a job lined up, with benefits and better pay, and I can give my back a rest. I handed him the paperwork, and he told me to come back after work and I could load up my bed after he'd processed my info. Promptly at 5 o'clock that night, I was back, card in hand and ready to load up. The salesman met me outside, apologetic. He'd not had time to run my paperwork, he said, but that was all right. I could still take the mattress that day, and he'd call me when he'd set up my payments. I couldn't complain too much about that, so his son helped me load the tightly rolled mattress into my hatchback and off I went. By the following week I'd still heard nothing back. The mattress had taken a couple days to air out, and it still smelled weird from newness, but overall I was loving it. Like the Lannisters, however, my parents taught me to always pay my debts, and I'd worked hard to earn this mattress. I had no interest in acquiring it in any dishonest way. I returned to the store by the second week to check on things. The salesman apologized profusely as he searched through even larger piles of paperwork on his desk. Things were crazy what with the closing, he explained, but he'd get my papers done eventually, he promised. Two weeks after that, as I was once again driving to work, I noticed that the mattress sign was gone. His delivery truck was no longer parked there, either, and the windows were empty and dark. I checked that night to confirm, and sure enough, he was gone. I had no way to contact him, either, since the only number available had been for the business. For years thereafter I waited to hear from him. I halfway thought that collections might show up at my door or in my mailbox or however they shake money out of supposed mattress thieves. I like to think he just scraped all those papers into a box in the end, and took great satisfaction in tossing that box on his celebratory bonfire that evening. I'll likely never know for sure, but four years later, I'm curled up on that same mattress, comfortably typing out this story. Somewhere I hope there's a happy long-distance truck driver who found a good job and a good life, so good, in fact, that the $600 he missed out on never even crosses his mind. What's an industry secret that we can use to avoid huge medical bills? I have been working as a dentist for 20 years, and some of my colleagues are more dirty than you think. Many times if a patient has a flossing issue, the dentist will recommend an expensive mouthwash kit that has the same formula as a $100 mouthwash. If the patient isn't brushing properly they'll tell you to buy an electric toothbrush that's not only overpriced, but also gives them commission. I could have gone down the same route, but I didn't. Instead, I make sure to put the patient's health as a priority because that's what I would want for my own dentist. I often recommend at-home solutions when the insurance doesn't cover a patient's treatment. But the most effective and sought-after hack is something that I'm about to reveal. A lot of problems like cavities, bad breath, and most gum diseases stem from one thing, 
an imbalanced pH level. This stems from the acids in your mouth and from the food you eat, resulting in odors forming from the pH level in your saliva dropping to a 5.5. The ideal pH level you want in your mouth is a 6.7. If your breath stinks that's probably why. Snacking during the day is one of the top contributors to why a patient's pH level drops. If you're unsure how to check this, lick your wrists on the side where the skin is sensitive. Let it dry for a moment and if the smell is bad, it's very likely that your pH level is imbalanced. A couple years ago a patient with a severely imbalanced pH level came to me and luckily I had the solution for them. The patient, a mother, came into my office with her toddler who refused to talk and kept holding his cheek in pain. After doing x-rays on him, we saw the beginnings of seven cavities. Typically, you find a couple cavities on most patients but this was a toddler whose adult teeth hadn't even come in and was developing cavities already at an early age. That's what we call dental caries. This kid was on the verge of gum disease at an early age, which is an ugly sight. When I see a child with teeth as bad as this, I morally have to assume that this child is in a dangerous situation at home. I sat down with his mother and asked why she waited so long to take him for an appointment or if she was administering any oral care for him. She told me that it was only recently that her insurance approved her and covered this appointment. I told her while I understood her position, that still didn't explain the condition her child's teeth were in. I remember watching her try to hold her composure in front of me. She told me in an effort to get him to enjoy solid foods, she started giving him lollipops and he developed a sweet tooth. It got so bad that he won't eat food unless it means he gets a lollipop afterwards. She was so afraid of her kid not eating that cavities didn't even cross her mind. Most dentists would have told her to keep coming back and charged her thousands for baby fillings, but I saw that she was struggling and just needed someone to give her a break. I told her to come back next week and I'd have something for her free of charge. I already knew what this baby needed. I went to my secretary's office and asked if we still had any of the tooth cleaning lollipops. She checked our storage closet and came out with an entire bag filled with multiple flavors of those lollipops that prevent cavities, and clean teeth. They had the golden component erythritol which is excellent for reducing acidity and in turn rebalances the oral pH level, stripping away the bacteria that infest your saliva. The best part is that this cleaning process only takes 10 minutes, and they taste amazing. I picked the bag and when the next appointment rolled around, I gave it to the mother. I advised her to give these to her son after every meal instead of whatever candy she was using before. After a couple more checkups, her son's teeth were healing well and there weren't any more visible signs of tooth decay thanks to the tooth cleaning lollipops. We worked something out for him to get fluoride varnish in the future when his adult teeth grow in place. I also wrote her down a referral for a nutrition specialist and told her that I'd be in contact with her insurance very soon to make sure that her son could develop the eating habits he needed. I remember her not saying a word, just hugging me tightly and rocking for what felt like an eternity. After that incident, I ordered more of the tooth cleaning candy from their site and made personalized goodie bags for my patients. You'd be surprised how many patients come in with the same problem and the tooth cleaning candy has been a success in treating each patient. I still have patients who tell me that they eat the lollipops months after our appointments because they know it keeps their mouths in good condition. To this day I've actually kept in contact with the mother, and I've seen her son grow up, Soon he's going to be starting middle school. He's been able to develop those better eating habits like we hoped but he still loves to have one of those lollipops, so maybe some habits don't need to change. Everyone met my wife's boyfriend and fears for her safety. Me and my wife are Polly. This weekend, my wife had invited her boyfriend over for breakfast and didn't prep for it at all. She was in bed minutes before he arrived and sent me to the store to buy everything we needed. I said we should go out at that point, but she said she wanted to cook. When I got home, he was already in my house with my wife in the master bathroom while she was getting ready. This made me tense because we had never had other people in our bedroom before, and my wife had previously marked it as her hard boundary. I was nervous about meeting this guy because we had a three-way phone call a month ago, and I wasn't digging his personality. Now I was on edge because of the groceries, because she wasn't ready, and because he was in my space. The guy comes out of my bedroom and he's wearing a full suit and tie while I'm in t-shirt and jeans. I perceived this as an odd choice and a power imbalance. My wife later told me he always wears suits, but that literally is not true because after breakfast he changed clothes to go on a date with her and ended up in a t-shirt and jeans. We sit down at the table and my wife starts cooking. Already this is uncomfy to me because the hinge is missing from our conversation. Previously we sat down at a table together, but my wife was effectively uninvolved in me meeting him for the first time, just occasionally chiming in while cooking. And we didn't really vibe. We'd ask each other a question or two and then it would peter out until a new topic came up. When the conversation died down, the boyfriend just spews intimate comments. When we previously spoke on the phone this is part of what made me uncomfy because the conversation was going well until he hyperfixated on intimacy and any other conversation broke down. I had previously conveyed this to my wife after the call, but I am ashamed to say I didn't stand up for myself. I have difficulty saying what I want to. In the moment. I was also trying to give him the benefit of the doubt and I didn't want to be too aggressive when meeting him the first time. My wife sits down with plates of food and the guy asks if he can sit next to her. We have a square table with a chair on each side. He picked up his chair and sat on the same side of the table as her. Which was super weird to me and made me uncomfortable. My wife later insisted he always does this. My beef is that it felt like he didn't view this as an opportunity to meet me, he viewed it as a date with my wife and also I was there. After the plates were put away I went to the bathroom and came back to them making out in the kitchen. This was my first time visually seeing my wife with another person and I was fine with it. But then, as I started doing the dishes, he pushed her down on the couch and fully got on top of her making out. My wife said no and pushed him off, so he went to the bathroom. At this point, I talked to my wife and said that her boyfriend was making me extremely uncomfortable in my own home and that I wanted him to tone it down. He walked up behind me, having gone in the hall but not actually gone to the bathroom, and said, don't mind me, I'm just eavesdropping. I asked my wife to meet me in private to express my frustration. She said that this is just how he is. 
I said we didn't talk about boundaries for this meeting and that many of the things he's done had crossed lines for me and made me feel uncomfortable in my house. She says to give her a minute and she'll take care of it. I return to the kitchen and he's changing clothes. He brought all his clean laundry in a suitcase and was cycling through outfits, asking my wife what she thought of each. I later told my wife that was extremely weird to me, especially since she went out there with the intent to tell him to tone it down. She said the alternative was that she and he go into the bathroom while he changes. Fast forward, they leave to go on there. Date. I stay busy the rest of the day and can't get a hold of my wife from noon to midnight. I go to bed, having asked her to check in three times. Called her, and no response. At 4 a.m. she woke me up to ask if he could spend the night because they had been out until 3.30 a.m. and it was an hour drive back to his house. I said no because we had planned a full day just us for the next day. My wife went out to talk to him, then came back and said he was too tired to drive and asked me to reconsider. I'm barely awake, so I begrudgingly say fine. My wife promises not to stay out so late again and we go to bed. Boyfriend sleeps in the guest room. My wife and I had planned to go to breakfast but had to put a pause on that because the boyfriend hadn't woken up by 10 a.m. I say we can get drive through breakfast and my wife sends me out alone because she doesn't want him to wake up in the house by himself. She tells me he'll be gone by the time I get back. At 10.45 I get home and he's still there. My wife comes down and makes him coffee because we didn't get him anything. Because he was supposed to be gone already. I told my wife point blank I wanted him to leave because this was our day together and we had already had to change plans because of him. She said that would be rude and that we still had the whole rest of the day just us. He ended up staying until noon. He didn't say a word to me as he sat at the table drinking coffee and then fist bumped me goodbye. When he finally left, my wife asked how I thought it went. I expressed everything I described here. Told her his personality made me uncomfortable, he ignored me, made me feel like a guest in my house, I didn't appreciate him spending the night. My wife said, thank you for being honest. I don't know how to respond to your concerns. It's important to me that you like him. I need to think about this. And shut the conversation down for now so we could focus on our planned day. My girlfriend's guy best friend has spent $10,000 on gifts for her. My girlfriend Liza and her friend Jay grew up in the same neighborhood, just a few houses down from each other. They were best friends in elementary school and then drifted apart a bit in middle school. During high school, Jay's parents went through a really nasty divorce. I'm not really clear on all the details but I know that Jay's dad moved out and Jay and his mom were really struggling financially. Liz's parents are about as kind, generous, and warm people you'll ever meet and they took care of Jay. He would often have dinner with them, do family stuff with them, crash at Liz's place. Over this time, Liz and Jay became best friends again and stayed that way until college. Jay ended up getting a major scholarship to a really good school out west and left for school while Liz stayed close to home. Over the years, they followed each other on socials but had little other contact. I met Liz a little over three years ago as part of a social league for volleyball in our city. By luck of the draw, we were placed on the same team, met each other at the welcome event and really hit it off. She is kind, gracious, smart, witty, beautiful, fun and is just the right amount competitive. She's the kind of girl that guys meet and fall in love with. And I guess I'm one of those guys but somehow, she also liked me. A year after meeting, we were moving in together and talking about the future. By no means is our relationship a fairy tale romance but we have weathered our fair share of storms and have what I believe to be a healthy relationship with a good intimacy life, strong communication and shared goals and values. We've talked marriage, kids, all of it. Here's where Jay comes back into the story. A few years back, Jay started a tech company with a friend. Their company grew rapidly and were bought out by a major player in the tech world. Jay moved back to our city this year. On Labor Day, we went to a party at a friend of Liz's from high school. Jay was also there. It was. The first time that Liz had seen him in probably five years so the two spent a lot of the party catching up. I'm not originally from the area so many of Liz's friends have become my friends so I was hanging out and let them catch up. On the way home from the party, Liz said that Jay had invited us over to his new house and that we needed to find a date. A few weeks later, we head over to Jay's house. From the moment he opened the door to greet us, Jay was weird to me. I think he didn't realize that I was coming too, maybe that Liz was coming by herself? Almost the whole day, Jay spoke only to Liz. When Liz would try to include me in the conversation or talk about me, Jay seemed to change the subject to reminisce about old stories. It was very strange and was just kind of exhausting. Eventually, I went inside to the kitchen to get a drink and chatted with Jay's chef, he has a private chef to make his food. The chef was cool and confirmed that he had been told it was Jay plus one guest for dinner. Liza and I tried to chalk that whole day up to a misunderstanding, that maybe he just wanted to continue catching up, but there have been plenty of awkward things since then. For example, when at Jay's, Liz saw a la crusade Dutch oven and said something about always wanting one but not being able to justify the cost. Well what shows up on our doorstep a few days later? The same exact La Crusade. She one time mentioned that she really likes a very expensive classic lounge chair but it's almost $4,000. It showed up at our place the next week. She said something the next day when we saw Jay but he gave this weird smile and said multiple times that he didn't know what she was talking about. Jay is building a new company that creates tech for the hospitality industry. For this reason, he has connections with restaurants and breweries all over the city. In the fall, he invited Liz to a special dinner at a chef's table that is inside of the kitchen at one of the nicest restaurants in the city. Jay knows the chef so they would get the royal treatment. When Liz asked if I could come as well, he told her that the table only seats two. Liz and I talked it out for a while and in the end decided that she would go without me and she reported back that it felt like two friends having dinner together. I was talking about the whole thing with a co-worker who told me she had also done the chef's table and the table seats four. 
At the beginning of December, Jay invited her to a special event at a local museum. One of the major museums in our city hosts a special Christmas party that you have to be invited to and is really exclusive. Think knockoff version of the Met Gala without the celebrities and holiday themed. Jay got two tickets and invited Liz. She's wanted to go for ages and never thought it was possible so again we talked it out and decided she would take him up on the offer. Again, she says he acted like a friend but in hindsight, it feels weird that he keeps inviting her to stuff like this. As I'm writing this out, I already feel like people are getting ready to tell me that she's cheating on me or that I'm a pushover for letting Liz go to one-on-one -on -one things with Jay. But we don't have the kind of relationship where I wouldn't let her do something she wanted and she is super honest with me. She's also a terrible liar, she has the easiest tells in the world. She's too moral and good-natured to keep a bad secret. That's why I believe her when she's assured me time and time again that Jay is very much in the friend zone. She is not interested. She believes that he is lonely and wants to return to being best friends. My worry is that Liz naturally sees the best in people. For example, if someone cuts her off in traffic, her natural response is that they must be in some kind of emergency situation. She genuinely trusts people, cares for people and wants the best for them. I, on the other hand, am a natural skeptic. I tend to think that people are just out for themselves. I find her optimism really beautiful but struggle to see the world in the same way. The long and short of it is that we both feel uncomfortable with the gifts and fancy dinners that he keeps getting her but when she brought it up to him, he says he is paying her back for taking him in in high school. He asked her to keep letting him do things for her because he feels like he needs to return the many favors her family did for him. Finally, this week, our friends got together for an annual Christmas party. It's been a tradition at that party to do a white elephant gift exchange. It's always weird stuff or funny items. Jay showed up with a second gift that he was cagey about all night. Someone thought it was part of the gift exchange and he kind of freaked out a bit. Near the end of the night, he pulled Liz aside and gave her this second gift. Inside was a designer handbag and a super expensive pair of designer heels. She felt very uncomfortable accepting them and in the awkwardness of the situation just said, thanks then we left soon after. Now, two days later, Liz has decided she wants to return the gifts to Jay and tell him they are too much, I think she said that they were almost $2,000 combined. I think we need to tell Jay to back off as well but Liz is saying that I'm being overly harsh. What I'm asking is, am I being too harsh in telling a guy to back off who is trying to repay former kindness? If I'm not out of line telling him to back off, how can we ask him to stop with the gifts without destroying the friendship? My pro-Trump neighbor parked their motorcycle in front of my driveway, and is suing me for destroying it. My neighbor parked their motorcycle in front of my driveway, and is suing me for destroying it. So me and my husband just moved to a really nice part of town because my husband got a really good promotion that came with a huge salary increase. For context, we have two younger children and one of them is still an infant. The one that is still an infant has a rare lung condition that requires us to visit the hospital somewhat frequently. And on some occasions we have to make emergency trips to the hospital. Now here is where that gets relevant. The house that we just moved into is extremely luxurious, we have a very nice yard, basketball court, and pool. However there is one issue. Our neighbors. They are the most classic pro-Trump, conservative family. Even despite having a huge driveway, they don't have space, because they have two monster trucks and one normal car, as well as a motorcycle. On the first day that we moved in, I didn't know it at the time, but their youngest son was just months away from his 16th birthday. I received a knock on the door and it was my neighbor, specifically the dad. We'll call him dad. Dad, good evening, how are you? Me, we're okay. I'm sorry I can't open the door but my youngest came home from school with a sore throat today and so I'm not sure what's going on with him. How are you and how can I help? Dad, I'm sorry to hear that, I hope it isn't anything serious. We are okay. My son just turned 16 a few weeks ago and I'm sure you saw the new motorcycle we just bought him me, yes, I did. It's such a pretty big motorcycle. Does he like it? Dad, yes, he does. It's what he wanted so we got it for him. It is very big and that's what I wanted to talk to you about me, I don't understand? Dad, we have been having complaints from some of the other neighbors that his motorcycle is so big that they can't get around it when they are driving. Through and we're afraid that it might get sideswiped if he continues to park it in the street. Me, yeah, I've had some intense moments trying to get around it myself, but I'm sure he will get better at parking as he gets more experienced. I'm not sure what this has to do with me, I haven't complained. Dad, oh, I know you haven't complained, which is why I was going to ask if he could use your driveway to park since you don't use it. Me, very stunned at this, um, I do use my driveway when I leave and come home. I can't get to my garage without using my driveway. Besides, I have issues with depth perception and your son's motorcycle is so big it will take up most of my driveway and I don't want to be responsible for any damage that might happen while it is on my property. Dad, well, we will make sure that he parks so that it will allow you to come and go without any issues. Me, that isn't possible. The only way he can park to allow me to get around him is if he parks halfway on my lawn and that wouldn't work because then he would damage my lawn. If you are concerned about his motorcycle getting damaged then why don't you let him park in your driveway and then one of your other smaller cars can park in the street. Dad, we've already discussed that and we would have to park two cars in the street in order for him to use the driveway. It would be very easy for him to park in your driveway and I can assure you that it will not be an inconvenience to you. You don't even use your driveway. Me, I'm sorry, but the answer is no. I'm not going to be responsible for his vehicle on my property and I need to be able to come and go without worrying about someone else's property. Dad, very upset at this point, you are not being very neighborly. I thought you were a nice woman. You don't use your driveway and this would benefit the whole neighborhood. Me, losing my temper at this point, listen, I told you no and I do use my driveway every time I pull into my garage and every time I leave. 
I'm sorry you don't have enough parking for all your vehicles, I'm sure it's frustrating, but it's not my problem that you decided to buy a vehicle that didn't fit your property. Now, while I also find it irritating to try to navigate the road with that motorcycle in the way, it is public parking and so I deal with it. I will not have anyone else's vehicle parking on my property. Now, if you don't mind, I have a sick kid and need to get back to him. Have a good day. With that, I closed the door and then looked out the peephole and saw him give me the bird before he turned to leave. I just shook my head and had to take a moment to understand that I actually just had that conversation. I then loaded my son up in the car and left to take him to minor emergency to get him checked out. All tests came back negative and I was told he probably had a run-of-the-mill virus and to keep him home and do self-care. Was told to bring him in if he got worse but not to worry. I went to work the next day and told my co-workers the story of my neighbor's request and they were shocked. I had one co-worker suggest that I send an email to my homeowners to explain what happened just to get it on record because it was such an odd request. I took her advice and typed up an email that day when I was at lunch and sent it. For those who want to know, it was just an FYI email, not a complaint email. It basically stated that my neighbor made a request to park on my property and when I declined, he got mad at me and I wanted it on record just in case anything ever happens. So very glad I did, so, Friday comes and my youngest son has been homesick since Tuesday afternoon. When I got home Friday evening, I checked him and he had begun to run a fever and was complaining of several other things. I had been doing self-care with him since Tuesday and he didn't appear to be getting any better, and started swelling up. The doctors informed us if this happened then we needed to take our son to the emergency room. So, I decided to take him back to emergency and loaded him up in the car. I opened my garage door and I was absolutely shocked to see that very big Ducati sitting in my driveway, blocking me. I can't describe to you how angry I was to see that vehicle sitting there. Now before anyone starts asking me how I didn't know it was in my driveway, it's because my street is very busy and cars are coming and going all the time and unless someone knocks on my door, I don't bother watching every vehicle that drives up and down the street. The only window that can see my driveway are the ones in my kitchen and I keep those curtains drawn and never look out of them. So, I get out of my car and stomp over to my neighbor's house and bang on their door. The mother of the house answers the door and this is the conversation, Mom, irritated and kind of angry, can I help you? You are interrupting our dinner. Me, your son is parked in my driveway after I told your husband he couldn't. I need to take my son to minor emergency and that motorcycle is blocking me in. It's at this time that dad walks up behind mom and proceeds to talk, Dad, he isn't blocking you in, you can get around him. Me, no I can't. You need to move that motorcycle or I'm going to call the police and a tow truck. I need to get my son in to see a doctor. Dad, turning to call for his son and then turning back to me, he's not blocking you but I will have him move it. Me, it doesn't matter whether you believe he is blocking me in or not. He is not allowed to park in my driveway. No one is allowed to park in my driveway and if I find an unauthorized vehicle parked in my driveway again, I'm not going to bother to knock on your door, I'm going to have it towed. It was at this time I saw the son arrive at the door with his keys in his hands and I turned to leave and head to my car to wait for him to move it and I heard him call me that famous B word every woman has heard at least once in her life. I ignored him and headed to my car and watched as he got in and after some effort finally was able to back out of my driveway and parked his motorcycle in the street a little way down the road. I was able to leave and take my son to the emergency room. But what my neighbors did next infuriated me to a point where I knew I had to do something. I would make sure that they would regret their actions. Update 1. After my neighbor decided to repeatedly park their new motorcycle in my driveway, I complained to them, however they did it once more. And it was even worse that I was trying to rush my son to the ER. I told them that if I ever saw their motorcycle in my driveway that there would be consequences. I took my son to the ER and luckily the doctors were able to get his condition back to normal. It was an excruciatingly long time at the hospital, I was there waiting for 7 hours, and it was already 3 a.m. As I was heading back I hadn't checked my phone but a couple hours earlier my husband texted me that the neighbors had parked their motorcycle back in our driveway. And I swore to God that if I came home at 3 a.m. and saw that motorcycle in my driveway, I would wreck it with a hammer. Not surprisingly it was there and I immediately went inside and got a huge sledgehammer from our garage. Despite the siren going off like crazy, I continued smashing that motorcycle until it was beyond repairable. At 6 a.m. I woke up to someone banging loudly and rapidly on my door. I didn't have to look to know who it was. The neighbors got furious and called the cops on me for breaking their motorcycle. I opened the door and had the following conversation. Police officer, good morning ma'am. Sorry to bother you, but we had a report from your neighbor. He is stating that you wrecked his son's motorcycle by having it towed from the street and we need to talk to you about this issue. Me, good morning officer. My neighbor is only telling you half the story. I had his motorcycle destroyed this morning from my driveway when I returned home from a minor emergency. I couldn't get into my driveway and I have already told him twice that he and his family can't park on my property. Police officer, so, you are saying that the motorcycle in question was on your property without your permission and that you had it destroyed? Me, yes. Last Tuesday he asked if I would allow his son to park in. My driveway. I told him no and he got mad at me and flipped me off before leaving. Then Friday evening, when I was leaving, I discovered his son had parked in my driveway and I couldn't leave my garage. I went over and demanded they remove the vehicle and I told them at that time that I would have the motorcycle towed if they parked on my property again. I came home late this morning and the motorcycle was in my driveway, so I had it destroyed. Police officer, I just want to confirm, you are saying that it wasn't parked on the street but in your driveway. And you have proof of this? Me, yes sir. After that the police officers had me sign a report and then were on their way. My neighbors are yapping about trying to sue my family and I, but I don't have the will to deal with them considering they have no grounds for that. Be an annoying boyfriend? Enjoy getting arrested and deported. I was born in the States but my family are immigrants.
My dad worked his ass off to becoming a citizen working three jobs and riding a bike to work because he couldn't afford a car. He and his dad saved all their money so they could get the rest of the family here. I say this because I understand the struggles immigrants face coming here and starting a new life without any support. I would never do what I did to someone actually trying to better their life. This piece of poop though didn't deserve to be here. The story is about my best friend's boyfriend. He lived with her in her family's house, renting a room, driving her car to work and using her cell phone that her parents paid for. She was 19 at the time and I was about 21. I was working at a club with my boyfriend. I worked really late and I had two kids. I asked my best friend if she could come over and watch them while they slept, basically just come hang out at my place. My sons were about six or seven years old. She asked if she could have people over, so she wasn't bored. I said sure I don't mind, but I asked that she just not throw any parties. We laughed as she agreed. Everything was fine when we got back. I thanked her and she left. Later that night I saw a cup with a cigarette butt in it. So I texted my friend and asked her if someone smoked in the house. I'm a smoker but because my son is really little and the older one has asthma so I didn't smoke in the house. The reply I received didn't make any sense. Reading what kind is it? I said I don't know. In my mind I'm like there were only two other PPL here, how could you not know if one of them smoked inside? She's not a smoker so I knew it wasn't her. I started receiving more questions instead of a yes or no answer. The replies also didn't make much sense. It was broken English and stupid spelling mistakes. By this point I knew I wasn't talking to her. Instead it was her boyfriend. My best friend. Is white and he's Mexican. He was trying to fool me so I would tell him who she was here with. I never liked him. Not for any specific reason he just rubbed me the wrong way from the beginning. They have been dating for about a year or two. By this point I knew he was a piece of poop. I really dislike him because of how he treated her. He was controlling and abusive. I didn't see her as much anymore because I had gotten into an argument with him at her house earlier that year. We all wanted to go out to a friend's place, but he didn't. He said she couldn't go either. She wanted to but he said no and I told her we were leaving. It was really late but this a-hole made a big deal about it. He decided it was a good idea to wake her dad so her dad would force her to stay home. This pissed me off because he has no respect. He lives in their home and he can't even let her dad sleep. Besides, she was an adult, not to mention her dad never cared if she was going anywhere with me. Her parents knew if she was with me she was safe. After that minor blow up I decided not to be around him. I wouldn't be able to hide my contempt for him. This is why she didn't come over to watch my kids with him. I didn't understand why she stayed with him, especially after she told me that he forced himself on her. I put up with him for my friend. But not for long. Update 1. Back to the texts, he's pretending to be her and I tell him I know it's him and talk she. He then said he was going to come over and shoot up my house with my kids still inside. I basically laughed to myself. I didn't believe him. I replied with a threat to get him deported. I got in touch with a mutual friend of mine and my best friend. She knew more about him. She told me he had a warrant out for his arrest. The cops had gone to pick him up one day but they didn't find him. I didn't know any of that. I also didn't know his full legal name. She gave me everything I needed. I told her what I was going to do and not to. Tell our friend. I called the cops and gave them his location. Everything they needed to know so they wouldn't miss him. They actually picked him up the same night. I then called ICE. He was put on ICE hold, and he couldn't get bailed out of jail now. Once in custody the only way he was getting out was when he reached Mexico. I felt bad for my friend and their daughter. I knew she would probably never see him again, but I believe I did her a favor. I ended up telling her what I did not long after. I didn't want her to find out through someone else and get even more upset with me. It's been so long since then. She never said she was mad about it. I'm sure it was tough for her in the beginning. Her life has completely changed in a good way. Her daughter has a better father now, someone who takes care of both of them. VP had lost everything he owned. Lost his girl, his side chick and was arrested and deported. He also lost any chance of having any real relationship with his daughter. I did hear that he came back but it took about 10 years. Their daughter was less than a year old. She's about 13 now. I believe he's met her once since all this happened. He got to see the great life she has without him in her life. My sister ruined my credit so I ruined her entire life. My selfish sister had always been the golden child of my family so I'm happy I could be the one to finally ruin her once perfect life. She was a rainbow baby and my parents miracle, so she was always spoiled and given special treatment when we were growing up. I am 21 and my sister is 18. After she was born, my parents gave me way less attention and started to spend all their time and money on her and would just ignore me. They bought her whatever she wanted and if she wanted something of mine I had no choice but to give it to her no matter how hard I cried. Even when I was in high school, and I started to buy my own things, she would let herself into my room and use my stuff and sometimes break things. Even after she broke both my PlayStation controllers on the same exact day, my parents didn't punish her or pay me back even though I had bought my PlayStation with my own money. Ever since she was a child she always threw loud tantrums where she threw herself on the floor, broke things, and screamed at the top of her lungs until she got whatever it was that she wanted. My parents made me pay for my own phone bill and my own school and sports supplies all throughout high school because they spent all their extra money on my sister and whatever clothes or electronics she wanted. They buy her a new iPhone every year and I still use my phone from 4 years ago. I always knew my sister was a spoiled little brat with no future, but I didn't know just how evil she was until this month. I finally saved enough money to finally move out of my parents' house, and get away from my toxic little sister. I've had it with her breaking and stealing my stuff and I couldn't wait Talib on my own. Anyway, 
I started looking for apartments and it was through this process that I found out my credit score was in the effing 200s, despite me never opening a line of credit in my entire life. If you don't know anything about credit scores, that is a dog's T score, and it meant I wasn't going to be able to move out anytime soon. I went to the bank and it was there where I discovered that my little sister had opened multiple credit cards in my name. She had maxed out every card she opened up and hidden all the credit bills that had been coming in the mail for me. I had never been so unbelievably angry in my life, I came home and showed my parents proof of what she had done. I wasn't even surprised when they defended her and said she was just a kid and probably didn't understand what she was doing. I had enough of them and I confronted my sister. I called her a useless, selfish beach and I told her that she was going to pay for all this. I told her that she was finally going to learn about the real world and that I didn't care if she was my family, she was a legal adult now and I was going to sue her off. My sister thought I was bluffing, she laughed in my face and said that my money was her money because I was her family and that's what family is for. I left the house for a couple of days and stayed with a friend, I talked to a lawyer and had my sister served with court papers. I shut off my phone when my parents started blowing it up after my sister was served. I went home the other day to pack some more things and my sister was red in the face, crying and begging me to drop the case against her. She threw herself on the floor and everything despite her literally being a legal adult. She was kicking my door as I packed and screamed at me that I couldn't do this to her and that she didn't deserve it. She said she would be ruined before she even graduated high school and this time I laughed in her face. My parents also begged me not to sue her, again they said she was just a kid. I told them that they hadn't cared about me at all when I was just a kid, so why the hell should I care about my sister? I'm suing her for every last penny that she stole from me, and then I'm never speaking to my family until the day I die. Update 1. It's been a long time since I made my first post, and things have only gotten more chaotic and depressing since I first found out my sister had completely destroyed my credit. I had been trying to move out on my own when I found out that my sister had maxed out a bunch of credit cards in my name and tanked my credit before I even had a chance to use it in my own life. A lot of people were completely correct and guessed that my parents had given her my social security number, and that's how she was able to open all of the credit cards without my permission. I still have no idea why they gave her my social security number. Part of me thinks that maybe they were all in on it together and that they shared the money that they got from the credit cards. I honestly didn't even care and I didn't even view those people as my family, just criminals who tried to ruin my life for their own selfish reasons. That's why I didn't feel bad at all when I decided to serve my sister with court papers when she was only 18. I would have never been able to repay the debts and raise my own credit so suing her was my only real option. My entire family begged me to drop the case and insisted that they didn't have the money for court fees or to pay me back, but again I really just didn't care. They had never cared about me, so I was just returning the favor. Things got really bad after the case started and my parents would constantly contact me saying that my sister's mental health was declining the longer the case went on. This really didn't concern me or affect my feelings at all since my sister had been the sole reason for my own mental health decline the entire time I had been living with my family. I only really started to feel bad for her when my parents started telling me that she had started doing drugs to cope with the stress of the case. As much as I hated my little sister, I would have never wanted her to be dealing with serious substance abuse issues. My parents said that she had gotten really into taking pills and just spent all of her time conked out on Xanax. My mom called me on the phone one day crying saying that this was all my fault and that if I never took her to court then she would have never started doing drugs. This honestly was a really upsetting call and I cried afterward too, just hearing my mom blame me for my sister's problems made me regret everything that I had done, even if my sister was in the wrong. I thought I couldn't feel any worse until my dad called me a couple weeks later and said that my sister had overdosed and that they were with her in the hospital while she was recovering. They said that they had come home and found her unresponsive on the floor, covered in her own puke. They rushed her to the emergency room just in time to save her life. As soon as I heard this I knew that I needed to visit her in the hospital. At the end of the day, she was my little sister and it was breaking my heart to hear that she was going through this. But when I got to the hospital my parents freaked out on me and told me to leave. They even went as far as to have hospital security escort me out. Now I'm sitting in my car outside the hospital because, at the end of the day, I just want to be close to my sister while she goes through this. Now I feel that I should have never done this to my family and I wish I could just take it all back. Steal a toy for me in elementary? I'll steal 80,000 when you grow up. In the third grade I was an awkward kid and had a mean drunk father, so I struggled to fit in and make friends and was bullied and shunned by other kids. One of my classmates, Derek, who regularly partook in bullying me, showed me kindness one day. Being deprived of kindness or attention so regularly I was putty in his hands. He hung out with me during recess when I was usually alone, we laughed and talked about girls we like, he even apologized for being an asshole to me. The reason he was nice to me was because I had brought a very popular, expensive Batman action figure to school with me to pass the time since I was alone mostly. I saved allowance and mowed lawns for two months to buy that toy. Everyone wanted one. By the end of the day he asked me if he could lend the action figure and like the naive, socially inept kid I was I trusted him with it. The deal was to return it the following morning. I went home so happy, completely fooled, I never suspected a thing. The following day he completely ignored me, when I tried to talk to him he acted like I was crazy. When I asked him to return the action figure he simply said, you never gave me any Batman, maybe you imagined it and when I persisted he threatened to beat my butt. When I complained to my teacher I was told that it was my own fault for bringing toys to school and I was afraid they would involve my father so I dropped it. I couldn't let my father know or I would be called a pussy and have my butt beat and punished for the next two weeks. What's worse is that Derek told all the girls that I confided in him about fancying that I lusted after them and that I wanked to them. 
I was a social outcast before that but at least I was tolerated, but after his smear campaign with the girls I was a leper and people wouldn't even look me in the eyes, not even the teachers. Kids started throwing stones at me, sabotaged and vandalized my property. It was hell. I did nothing about it but cry, I was just a weak-willed kid after all but to this day I wish I bit someone's ear off or anything in retaliation. After a while the bullying died down and I focused on my studies and started getting good grades. Derek started talking to me again but I ignored him completely. Sometimes he would repeat, why are you being such a baby, you didn't give me anything, you imagined it. By the end of the year we moved houses and I transferred to another school not far away. Things were much better there, I finally had friends and I was not as naive anymore so I was not as easily targeted. But I was still mostly me and still got picked on now and then. Over the years I became somewhat of a delinquent and in high school I got into regular fights, I may have been overcompensating for the lack of a spine I had in my younger years. I bartended in nightclubs, hotels, and cruise liners in my early 20s, this helped me a lot to be more socially adept and to understand social dynamics and human nature. I finished trade school and qualified as an electrician and later as a plumber. I know, water and electricity, but believe it or not, I thought it was ingenious at the time. I started my own business, developed a reputation for excellent workmanship in my local area and did well for myself. When I was 29, I received a call out at 2 in the morning for a flooding emergency at a local residence. When I got there the place was a mess, water was jetting out of a burst pipe and electrical equipment was shorted, it was highly dangerous. The living room floor was caved in due to a sinkhole. I was met by the wife, let's call her Jane, hysterical and beside herself, she somehow thought that she was responsible which I found odd. I assured her that it couldn't possibly be her fault. He arrived not five minutes later, his demeanor was irate, he didn't greet or shake my hand when I offered and I recognized him immediately. Derek from all those years ago. He demanded to know why I have not begun fixing the issue yet. I was professional and told him what I'd told the wife in terms of costs but I hid the written quote in my vehicle. I told him who I was and acted happy to see him, and assured him that he was in good hands. After a while of arguing with his wife he seemed to calm down and joked around with me, I knew I had fooled him. Here's where my revenge began. Update 1. Steal a toy for me in elementary? I'll steal 80,000 when you grow up. Derek and I talked about our careers, kids, our school days, I gave him tips and fake recommendations, we got along great, his trust was easy to gain. He must have thought of me as a complete sucker. I assured him that he was in good hands and this would be fixed in no time. I was careful not to start any actual work on the property, doing the smallest thing would make me responsible for all of it. Derek left after an hour or so and his wife stayed behind. I started my revenge. When I was doing my assessment I noticed that most of the building did not comply with city regulation and did not adhere to the registered and approved plans. There were multiple safety hazards and all plumbing and electrical work were completed by unqualified and uncertified people in an attempt to save money. Also, the pipe in question had been leaking for a few weeks at least, getting worse by the day and finally causing disaster, which means their water bill would be astronomical at the end of the month unless a qualified plumber endorses a rebate with the municipality. I called my contact at the city, let's call him Donovan, and notified him of all the regulatory violations, safety hazards and non-city compliant installations on the property. I also told him of the possible water bill. He promised to be there the next day. I immediately started photographing and documenting. The following morning my contact was there at 10, he had a field day. He informed Derek's wife of the calamity that was to come. They would be forced to tear down all the building additions, remove all the uncertified plumbing and wiring installations, have the plans re-approved, and start from scratch, which is an estimated loss of approximately 950,000. Derek was there in minutes, he was livid. He quickly threatened legal action but Donovan simply told him that he had more than enough photograph evidence to have the property declared invalid within a week if Derek did not comply in writing. Donovan reminded Derek that he does this for a living and that the city has more legal resources to waste money on. I left Derek an invoice for my time just to smear salt in the wound and took my leave. Later he called me and called me every name under the sun, I remained silent and he hung up. He went on a Facebook rant about me, which was a bad idea, as all of the community stood up for me and it started a storytelling competition where all kinds of people revealed stories of unsavory things Derek did to them in the past. Apparently Derek has always been an asshole, he never changed. One day he called me and asked to meet, he sounded defeated and depressed so I decided to meet and see what's up. I met him at a busy local convenience store. I know better than to take Derek the weasel at face value, so I noticed quickly when he laid his phone screen down on the table I knew he may be recording the conversation. He apologized for his behavior which surprised me, and told me that this whole dilemma has all but bankrupted him. He told me he took out a loan for the building additions and cut corners to save money, and that everyone does it. He showed me the water bill which was nearly 80,000, a problem easily erased with a qualified plumber's signature and endorsement. I refused. He got irate again. Then he asked me, why did you do this to me? I know I was a dick to you when we were kids but I don't deserve to have my end. My wife's lives ruined because of mistakes I made when I was a kid. What kind of person are you? You told me I was in good hands, I trusted you, you assured me you would help me, then you stabbed me in the back. You quoted me only a few hundred and told me not to worry. I replied, I said no such thing. He knew I was destroying him financially because of a Batman action figure he stole from me 20 years ago. I could see it in his eyes, but he couldn't bring himself to say it. His expression was a mixture of astonishment and disgust. I looked him dead in the eyes for a few seconds for effect then got up and left. I slept like a baby that night and had a goofy smile all week after. My boyfriend won't talk to me and is suggesting we break up after I saw his burn scars. 
TLDR, my boyfriend's house burned down when he was young after electrical issues were never disclosed to his parents. He and his father were severely burned. They lived but his mother died. He and I met in freshman year and became best friends in sophomore year. I've never seen his scars in full good view, until now, only small glimpses if his shirt wrote up and he'd quickly fix his shirt to cover it. He always hides his scars, constantly wearing jeans slash pants and long sleeve shirts even if it's super hot outside, his scars start from the bottom half of his ribs to just above his knees so this is the only way he can cover them, even bringing his pajamas into the bathroom to change into. He's done this ever since I've known him. Even after segs, which we do in the dark, which doesn't bother me because I know this is what makes him comfortable, he'll immediately get changed back into his clothes back on before we cuddle or do anything else, once again, I'm fine with this just trying to explain that I know how uncomfortable he is with his scars, I know he is ashamed of his scars and when we were friends I was fiercely protective and always changed the subject if his scars got brought up, which he always thanked me for. I have never and would never ask or pressure him to show me. I don't judge his scars or think they're ugly. I thought he knew I wouldn't judge him because some of his dad's burn scars are impossible to cover up, one of them covering half his face and never once have I judged or even thought his dad's scars were disturbing. He's a very handsome man they both are which is why I'm so confused by his reaction and accusations of this. I work weird hours, I'm a nurse, so sometimes I can come home at 9am, sometimes 5pm, sometimes the s crack of dawn. I went to immediately take a shower. I was in airplane mode and was completely exhausted. I opened the bathroom door. And he was getting changed. I saw his scars. I'll admit, I stared not because I thought they were gross but because I was having an oh shit moment knowing I effed up. He and I have been dating for quite almost a year. I had to move into his place a while ago after my parents went no contact and cut me off after I came out and told them I was dating boyfriend, long story short, toxic bible thumping parents, so I'm not used to sharing an apartment with someone. He blew up at me, yelling at me to get out, note, he has never yelled at me before this, sure we got in spats and small fights where he raised his voice but he never full on yelled, I shut the door and he went quiet. I was pacing in the kitchen for almost 20 to 30 minutes when he quickly walked past me trying to leave when I stopped him. He was pissed. Yelling at me that he thought, I backslash, would know how to knock by now and questioning if I did it on purpose. I was trying to explain while trying not to cry because I saw how red his eyes were, I knew he was crying. I couldn't say anything just made incomprehensible sobs as I tried to explain that I was but he wouldn't listen and left without saying where he was going. I'm heartbroken. He texted me an hour ago with a single message of I'm not coming home, tomorrow we can talk about our relationship. I immediately messaged him back asking what that meant and spent several minutes watching that little text incoming bubble bob in and out before he texted whether we should stay together? As if it was obvious I have no idea what to do. He's my boyfriend. My best friend of 8 years. What the hell do I do? I love him. I can't imagine life without him. His dad is like a father to me. I have nowhere else to go if he kicks me out. Above it all, I can't lose him. I'd rather have to go through coming out again than lose him. How do I make it up to him? How do I let him know that I'm sorry and never meant to make him uncomfortable? Edit, you slash Valor Fox potatoes brought. Up a good point that made me think so I should specify, he was bullied for his scars. A huge bully of his from middle school always sniffed the air when he entered a class and said, really loudly, you you guys smell that? Smells like bacon's burning. He was a little chubby in middle school, every time he entered a room then laughed. Also, in small glances, a lot of our guy friends would say how cool it is. Looks like Deadpool's skin. They were trying to be nice but failed horribly, hence my fierce protectiveness over anyone bringing it up, and his family always emphasized it doesn't matter what he looked like on the outside because he was beautiful on the inside, seriously what the f, he's also mentioned having a really bad ex-girlfriend who had issues with his scars in the past but never went too deep into it and I'm starting to wonder if that's what his overreaction and suggestion of a breakup was rooted in. I'm taking mental notes on all the comments on what's the best way to approach this and they're really helping, thank you. Update 1. Here we go. A lot of your comments were very helpful and I didn't get to reply to some but I read them. Most of them were along the same basis, get him to go to therapy and make sure he knows his scars aren't an issue for me. As well as setting up a place to stay in the worst case scenario that he kicked me out, spoiler alert, that did not happen, I didn't sleep a lot last night and based on some comments, thank you I decided to send a text that I love him and his scars don't bother me so that it could relieve some tension. He didn't respond to that but he came back in the morning. We talked for hours, where it started with me apologizing for walking in on him and that I didn't mean to. He admitted that he knew that and apologized for yelling. I suggested we get locks on doors and he seemed pretty happy about that. To clear the air, I asked him about the whether we should stay together? Text and if it was rooted in his. Ex-girlfriend. Basically, asking if she broke up with him over that. He admitted that he thought she didn't mind his scars and took his shirt off in front of her. She decided to gasp and start making a big deal about how he cheated her and that he made it seem like the scars weren't that bad and broke up with him. I have a newfound hatred for her now, he said he knew it wasn't an excuse but his brain immediately went to that and he freaked out. I asked if he wanted to break up and he was just trying to find an excuse and he quickly said no, specifying that he was just trying to give me an out if I wanted it. When I tell you I was relieved. He asked if I wasn't disgusted why I stared and I said that I had an oh shit moment of panic knowing I effed up. He felt awful and apologized for making me feel so uncomfortable in our home, every time he says our home I have a serotonin high, and that he'd try to work on being more comfortable with his scar.s that's when I suggested therapy. He instantly got defensive saying that he already had therapy and it didn't work very well. I pointed out that the way he wants us to live isn't healthy, that we can have locks and a knock before entering policy but him expecting me to never see him naked was unfair to both of us. That it was his insecurities getting worse and me enabling it. He was dismissive of these points saying how it wouldn't change things, it didn't work the first time why would it work now? I pointed out how he almost threw out a 9-year-old relationship over me accidentally walking in on him. 
he tried to say that locks would help stop that from happening again, me walking in on him not him throwing out the relationship, and I said it might, but I don't want you walking on eggshells either. I want you to be comfortable with me. I want you to trust me. He begrudgingly agreed to talk to his dad about what therapist he went to and going to to see them, I'm going to text his dad just to make sure. He does this in a few days, I also repeated a suggestion that other people suggested about getting tattoos or going to couples counseling and he just stared. He asked something along the lines why do you care about seeing my scar so much? You didn't care before. Not mean or aggressive just genuine confusion. I kinda laughed awkwardly and said I thought that you would show me on your own when you're ready but I don't know about that anymore. Baby, I love you but I don't want you to feel like you have to hide your scars from me. Nor do I want you to worry about me breaking up with you over seeing your scars. I love all of you including your scars. He started crying, wasn't the first time in the conversation, tons of tears shed on both ends, and I comforted him. He said he didn't want me to be stressed out in our home and that he was sorry. He was a lot more open to couples counseling than personal therapy which was a half win that I'll take, for now, we talked about our future some more and I asked if he ever thought that he'd be comfortable with me seeing his scars. He said that he wants to show me but he's not ready yet I was happy to accept that especially since he's agreed to couples counseling and therapy. I am so proud of him. I've summarized a lot here but once again this was a very long, long talk. We got dinner and slept, which we both really really needed, and as of today I'm doing research on a couple therapists while he went to work. Long story short we are getting on a better path with a plan for the future where I can see his scars. My sister-in-law told my stalker schizophrenic ex my whereabouts. My ex-boyfriend Jake, and I broke up a few years ago because he had a sudden psychotic episode and chased me around the entire neighborhood with a machete. He was placed in a mental health ward. Following this his entire personality changed and he developed delusions, hallucinations and paranoia that the people were out to get him which never went away. Also, a large part of his paranoia revolved around me controlling people around him and thinking I was trying to make him look crazy. He was let out of the hospital after some time and I took responsibility for him. He was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia. I did everything I could to be there for him, I went to all of his mental health appointments and stayed up at night to make sure he didn't leave the house alone. Even though we were no longer together I cared for him. We kept talking for a little while as friends, I think the entire time we kept contact he assumed we would get back together at some point. When I started a new relationship with my current partner Sam, Jake had a really bad psychotic episode and threatened both of us. He accused me of cheating on him with Sam before we broke up and sent both of us intense messages threatening he would turn us into pasture for his bloodhounds. Following this I cut all contact with Jake. The only slight connection I have to Jake is my brother's girlfriend Jess. Her and Jake have been friends for years and have maintained their friendship. She knows the entire background to our relationship and never chooses sides. Later on, I got pregnant with Sam's baby in January and was three months pregnant. I had just told my family and close friends about the pregnancy. I told everyone to keep it quiet as I didn't feel ready to publicly announce it. Less than 24 hours passed after telling my side of the family and I received a phone call from Jake. He had found out I was pregnant and left a voicemail. Saying he would be filing for custody of the baby? Obviously he was in a psychotic episode so I ignored his calls and let his family know that he had reached out to me. By this point it had been over a year since we had even spoken. He has no idea where I live or work so I'm not worried about him showing up physically to confront me. I knew the only way he could have found out would have been through Jess. I called and confronted her about it and she admitted to it. She was extremely apologetic and said she didn't think it would matter, she thought he would be fine with the news and said he deserved to know. I was upset by this, but I hadn't explicitly told her not to tell Jake so it could have just been a mistake. I forgave her but made it very clear that she shouldn't tell Jake any more information about me or the baby and she agreed. I didn't hear anything from Jake for months. Last weekend was my baby shower. Sam and I had the baby shower together, it was more of a party than a traditional baby shower. We hired a function room at a bar and invited 80 people to come celebrate. We were all having a great time until I saw Jake standing at the bar, looking around. I managed to slip away without him seeing me and grab security to get him escorted out. I watched as security approached him and asked him to leave, he was furious and started yelling. He spotted me and tried running to me before being grabbed by security. He ended up biting one of them. He was yelling and demanding to talk to me before he would leave. Sam and several friends went over to him to try and talk him down but it only escalated. He screamed at Sam, claimed that he was the baby's real dad and that we had never really broken up. At this point I left to hide in the ladies room until my mum came to let me know Jake was gone. He had eventually left after a little more screaming. I was mortified and we cut the baby shower short, I couldn't stop crying. It's now been a few days and I confronted. Jess. She is the only person who would have possibly told him the location and time of the baby shower. I wasn't as kind on the phone with her this time. She admitted to telling him and apologized. But said how could I keep this a secret from him? I was furious and told her that she would no longer receive any news about me or the baby and that I would cut her out of my life. My brother called me after and asked me to forgive her. He knew she was wrong but he didn't think he should also be punished for what she had done, he knew that by cutting her out I also wouldn't be telling him any news about the baby. In part he thought I should blame Jake for his reaction and not Jess, that she hadn't known he would show up, the damage was already done and I should let it go. Update 1. I had my baby earlier than anticipated in Sam and I moved into a new house. I heard from Jake's family that he was on an extended mental health hold at the hospital as his psychotic episode was not subsidizing and he refused to take his medication and started painting really disturbing things. Apparently many of his paintings included me. I also warned them about his relationship with Jess and they seemed to take it seriously, they would keep an eye on them and told the hospital that she was not to be allowed visitation with him. My family stopped pestering me to forgive Jess. 
My mom had a heart to heart with me and finally understood why I had to cut my brother out. I didn't hear anything from my brother, apparently my mom had stepped up and had a conversation with him about the severity of what Jess had done. It broke my heart to push my brother away as we had been so close. Unfortunately things didn't stay so calm. After a few months I received a call from Jake, he had finally been released from the hospital and was embarrassed about his behavior at the baby shower. He told me he knew that the baby wasn't his. He cried and asked to speak with Sam, he wanted to personally apologize to him. Sam didn't want to talk to him. I told him I forgave him, I knew it wasn't his fault and that we should move on. I was also very firm with him and told him that under no circumstances would I let him be around me or my baby. If he tried to contact us I wouldn't hesitate to call the police. He told us this was not over. About two weeks later Jake showed up at Sam's workplace, with a gash on his head and was demanding to speak with him. They had a short conversation where Jake broke down in tears and begged to be forgiven. From what Sam told me he didn't seem to be stable, in his apology he said I'm so sorry for confronting you in public like that, I should have spoken to you privately. Clearly you didn't know the baby wasn't yours and you were humiliated in front. Of your friends. Sam didn't want to provoke him so said he accepted his apology and asked him to leave. Sam then called me to let me know what had happened. I was shattered. Obviously Jess had told him where Sam worked. I called Jake's family to let them know what had happened. They told me the next day he hadn't come home and were extremely worried. He wasn't meant to be driving as his license had been suspended but he had taken his mom's car without her permission. A few days later he was found by police in a building that was under construction, completely out of it and confused. He had driven 20 hours away from our town. He was taken to the local hospital and placed in their mental health ward, his family flew up to retrieve him. After all of that my brother called me and asked if he could meet up with me for lunch one day and I agreed and we met up. Then he told me all the crazy stuff that had happened with Jess. Apparently when Jake got out of the hospital following the baby shower incident he had shown up at their house to see Jess. My brother was really worried because he could tell that Jake was in a manic episode. He kept an eye on Jake while he visited and noticed that he was being extremely touchy-feely with Jess who started to seem flirty with him as well, it made him really uncomfortable so he made an excuse about him and Jess needing to go to a friend's house. When Jake left him and Jess had a massive fight. He confronted Jess about the flirty behavior and she was extremely defensive. She flat out denied that she had been flirting or that Jake had been touching her at all. My brother decided to drop it. Not long after Jake showed up at their house again but this time Jess was at work. Jake told him that he was in love with Jess, confessed that they had been sleeping together and showed him a bunch of text messages between the two of them to prove that he wasn't making this up. My brother asked him to leave. When Jess got home he confronted her. At first she tried to deny it but eventually confessed. She begged my brother to forgive her, she had realized after his outburst at the baby shower that she didn't love him. My brother was furious and told her to stay with her parents for a while. Ever since then he hasn't heard from her, it's been months now and it looks like things are over between the two of them. Who is that one stranger that you never forgot? When I was 15 years old, I ran away from home because I was pissed off at my parents for a reason I can't remember. I didn't have much money, so I decided to hop onto the Skytrain, public transport train in British Columbia, and ride it as far as it would go. I reached the end of the line in less than an hour, and decided I wanted to ride it all the way back again, while trying to formulate some kind of plan of how I wanted to live the rest of my life without my parents or anyone. At the last stop, or the first stop depending on your perspective of it, a girl came on and sat in the row right behind me. I didn't pay much attention to her at first, as I was busy writing my life plan on a napkin. It was a few minutes later that she got up and came sat next to me, curious as to what I was writing. I told her the story, and after a few laughs, we began talking about everything and anything. Her name was Amanda, 17 years old, and absolutely wonderful. She told me she was getting off at the last stop, which was also the first stop, depending on how you look at it. It was also the stop I had gotten on originally, and I told her we would ride to it together. The train ride took less than an hour, and what a wonderful hour indeed. When the last stop did come, we both knew we probably wouldn't see each other ever again, this was before the days of cell phones, and I was a shy little kid afraid to make moves. As we got to the end of the sidewalk which split in two different directions, she went right and I went left. Before saying goodbye she turned to me and asked me a question that has become a wonderful part of my life, she asked me, tell me something you have done, or want to do, that you think I should do? It can be anything, as challenging as you want it to be, or as easy. As long as you give me the rest of my life to complete it, I promise I will do it. I was confused as to why, but I thought about it, and told her, sing an acapella song in a room full of strangers, she said perfect and asked me if I would like a challenge as well. I told her I did, and she told me, read, from start to finish, Ulysses by James Joyce. I had never heard of it at the time, but I agreed, and we said our goodbyes. I have an awful memory, and can't remember most conversations I have with most people. But I remember all of that clearly. You know why? Because of the challenge she gave me. In the 12 years that have passed since, I have tried to read that book in over 150 different sittings. Every time I open my copy of the 780-page monster of a book, I always think of her, and I always think of that day. I've never been sure if it was her intent or not, but she left her lasting memory on me with that challenge. I soon after learned what she did, was a completely wonderful and amazing thing for me. So I decided to keep it going. I've met a lot of strangers in my life, some that have become friends, and some, due to living in different time zones and whatnot, didn't. I don't want to just have experiences and then let them go. I want to remember these meetings, and embrace the fact that they happened. So whenever I leave someone who has left an amazing impact of my life, I always make sure to add them to my Ulysses bucket list. 
I ask them to give me a challenge, as difficult or as easy as they want it to be, and regardless of the fact that they have done it or not, simply something their heart has wanted to do. Some have been easy and fun. I met a man in India nine years ago who told me to, for a week or a month, cook and buy twice as much food as I intend on eating, and give the other half to a stranger in need. I completed that mission eight years ago, and thought about that man and the time we had all the way through. I met a girl on a cruise six years ago, who told me to jump into a body of water on a slightly cold day, without touching or feeling the temperature of the water first. I did that the very same year. I met a couple at an outdoor music festival a few years ago that told me to wear the most bizarre outfit imaginable and walk through a public place, completely oblivious to the fact that you aren't looking normal. I did that task the very next day, at the same festival. Some have been difficult, to say the least, three guys I met in Amsterdam and smoked all night with, told me to go to a mall and give 10 strangers 10 presents. That one took a lot of courage, but I did it a year or so after I met them. It was nerve-wracking, but at the same time exhilarating leaving my comfort zone. A girl I met on a plane told me to skydive, I'm still in the process of getting that done. A couple I met in Cali on the beach told me to tell the five people I hated the most, that I love them and respect them. That one was very difficult because of my stubbornness, but I've come close to completing that list many times. Still in the process, two more people to go. And some things, have had an everlasting impact on my daily life. I met a girl at a music festival, who told me that whenever I get mad at someone, walk away, sing my happy song in my head for five minutes, go back to the person I'm mad at with a clam heart in mind, and work things out. I've made this my way of life. I once met a man at a gym in a hotel I was staying at, that told me whenever your body and brain tells you that you are exhausted and done, use your heart instead and push out two more reps. I've made this my motto when working out or working on any kind of extenuating exercise in which my body demands me to quit. I also use it while working on anything, and while studying. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever received. There are many others that each brought joy to my life. There are still many tasks I have yet to accomplish, and every time I think of these tasks, I think of the people that gave them to me. It amazes me how well I remember all these people, while I can't remember so many aspects of even yesterday. These experiences, not only do I take from them a mission or a challenge, I also take from them a memory of them that never fails to appear inside of my mind. I opened my Ulysses book for probably the 300th time yesterday, and read a few pages, which prompted me to share this story with you today. I'm in the final 30 pages of the book, also known as the most dreaded of the read, in the last 40 pages or so, James Joyce doesn't use a single punctuation mark, no periods, no commas, no nothing, a straight 50-page run-on sentence. I never saw Amanda after that day, nor do I know if she ever did get a chance to sing a song to a room full of strangers. But what I do know, is that she gave me a gift that has never once stopped giving. So wherever you may be, thank you for giving me the Ulysses bucket list. And I swear I'll finish it one day. My life advice? Simple, create your own Ulysses bucket list. I abandoned my family because they deserved it. I abandoned my wife and my 13-year-old daughter a week after I discovered my wife's affair. It's now almost six months since that day. I discovered her affair by chance. Our marriage had plenty of intimacy and was in good shape. I came home late from work, and there was a safety training seminar I had to attend. My wife Eve was sleeping on the sofa and a message with some emojis popped up on her phone. Emojis like I would use when I message her. I snooped and I found out what had been going on for at least five months. I knew the affair partner, Adam, he was a work colleague of hers. He was married and had three children. While reading the messages something just snapped in my head. It fundamentally changed me. Over the course of reading their messages, I went from loving Eve more than anything, to hating her to just going blank. Not just about her, but everything. Totally numb, I took pictures of the messages and went to bed. Eve was mad the next day that I went to bed without waking her up. She complained about neck pain from sleeping on the couch all night. I wasn't really listening, I just remember thinking how everything was muffled. During breakfast I didn't say a single word, my wife and daughter chatted away. They didn't seem to notice anything different about me. Or even acknowledge me. But I definitely didn't feel like myself. I went through all the daily motions, I went to work, did all the normal stuff. The only difference is I sort of stopped talking. Sadly I realized that nobody seemed to even notice. It's like I wasn't even there. I started to understand that Eve and my daughter didn't really love me. I was in the house with them, but unless they wanted something from me they didn't really interact. I would get these pangs of pain, they would come and go. Sometimes they would overwhelm me completely. I walked around like this for five days before Eve asked me if something was wrong during dinner, I had maybe uttered. Three words in total to her and my daughter in that period. I didn't even answer her question, I just made a confused face, then continued eating. She seemed okay with that. The next day I didn't go to work. I didn't really have a plan. I put it in my car and walked around the neighborhood for a while. I ended up at the kitchen table waiting for the wife to come home. She came home with a few bags of groceries, she immediately started talking about her day while unpacking. I just sat at the kitchen table in pain. She didn't even look at me apart from one glance as she entered the kitchen. Daughter popped in and did the same. Their backs were turned to me and they talked about some trivial crap on sale. I have never felt so rejected, unappreciated, so alone. I felt totally invisible, like I wasn't there, or that I wasn't worth acknowledging. I was thinking back on our lives and all I could see was that they didn't care about me at all. They probably never did, I was an accessory to their life. I was hit with a wave of pain, I cried, still they didn't notice so I got angry, very angry. I had a glass of water in front of me, I stood up and threw it hard at the tiles over the sink. It just exploded, glass shards rained over everything. 
They froze, unsure what to do when they saw my contorted tear-soaked face. It was uncomfortably quiet for a long while before I spoke. Eve, I know all about your cheating with Adam. My daughter looked at Eve what? Is that true mom? Eve started to try to explain. She briefly glanced at me and said sorry, I can explain. Then she turned back to our daughter and they started arguing. Again it was like I was invisible or something. After a few minutes watching their increasingly heated argument I just walked out and got in my car, I looked at them again through the window, still arguing in the kitchen. They didn't even notice I had left. I sat there for a few more minutes before I gave up and just drove off. It took maybe 15 minutes. Before Eve tried to call me, then call after call after call, then a flood of texts from both of them. I just ignored it and eventually turned the phone off. The next day I took half of our money out and called my boss. I told him I didn't know when I would be back. He told me if I didn't show up I was fired. I just told him okay and hung up. I just didn't care. I went to Adam's house, his wife opened. I gave her a copy of the messages and told her what Adam and my wife had been up to. I left her crying on the stairs. At the end of the day I ended up in a cheap hotel at the edge of town. The next few days were kind of a blur. Eve's older brother is a cop named Bob. Bob showed up on the fourth day. I don't know how he found me. He tried to interrogate me, but I didn't say anything. When I didn't engage, he told me I was under arrest and put me in cuffs. However he didn't take me to the station like I expected. He took me home instead. Bob dragged me into the living room where my wife and daughter immediately started berating me. Still I said nothing. I just listened in amazement while they told me how terrible this was for them. When a terrible a-hole I was for making them worry. It went on for a while, in the end Eve screamed at me say something. I stared at her for a while before calmly saying I have nothing to say to you beach. Bob freaked out, and slammed me against the wall. Screaming at me to not talk to his sister that way. I got a lot of satisfaction out of Bob's violent reaction. I don't know why, it made me so happy I was laughing. Bob's wife left him four months earlier. I smiled at Bob, you're pathetic Bob. Did you hurt your wife Bob? Is that why she left you? Bob hurt me hard, I went down. Wife and daughter started screaming their heads off. As I started to get up I just laughed even harder. I just couldn't help myself. I am still in handcuffs, laughing. I said, F you Bob. He knocked me out cold this time. I woke up in the hospital. I puked all. Over the floor the second I opened my eyes so I knew I had a concussion. Eve, Bob and my daughter were there, they were talking to me, I was too confused to make it out. A nurse appeared and asked them to leave. She got me a pan to puke in and called someone to clean. While she was taking my pulse, I told her that my family put me here and that they were not to come anywhere near me. If they came back into the room I would leave, I would just run away. She argued kind of sternly that running or even getting up was a really bad idea for me. But she would talk to security. I didn't see them again in the hospital, it was bliss. I decided to disappear, to turn into a ghost, I wanted nothing to do with these people ever again. I made a letter to each of them, I warned Bob that if he ever bothered me again I would report him. I told my daughter that Eve had betrayed me and that she would be without a father from now on. To Eve I made a longer letter. I tried to be as practical as possible. I told her to sell the house, that I won't be paying the mortgage or utilities anymore. I told her reconciliation, or even contact was impossible, especially after she had sent her brother to drag me back and hurt me senseless in front of them. I explained that I won't do anything for her ever again, so if she wants a divorce she will have to arrange it. I told her I will disappear and I don't want to be found. I ended it with if she interferes with my life again I will simply end myself. I really regret giving her that last sentence. It's like I let her steal a little bit more of me, like I let her give me a little more pain. In the hospital I made a plan on how I could disappear. Eve gave the hospital some fresh clothes that they forwarded to me. Then one evening I just went out the rear fire escape. I triggered some kind of alarm I was panicking a bit but thankfully no one stopped me. I got back to the hotel to pick up my car. I traded it with a small RV and set off. I got a new phone. The only person I called was my father. I told him everything and told him if he gave my new number to anyone I would become totally unreachable, forever. He could call me if he needed to reach me if I needed to sign something. Other than that I wanted to be left alone. For the first few months I grieved the loss of my old life, but I came to realize that I grieved the loss of a fantasy. A memory that only existed in my head. The loving wife and daughter, the family, friends. It was all just an illusion in my head. These people never really cared for me. Over time I started to rebuild a sort of life. Only this time I was a total ghost. I rent a safety deposit box to keep valuables and cash. I do odd jobs for money. I hunt and fish and scavenge. My money consumption is insignificant so my cash reserves are actually growing. I don't pay taxes, I don't have a bank account. When people ask my name I answer people call me Fred. I go out of my way to not contribute to society or anything else for that matter. All in all my life is getting better. At least now no one is using me for nothing but their own benefit while pretending they care about me. I don't know what happened to my wife and daughter, my old friends or the rest of the family. I don't know if I am divorced now or if I owe child support. I don't know what happened to the house. I don't really care. My father has tried to give me information a few times but I shut that down hard. He is the only one I speak to occasionally for my old life. Karen mother attacks me for not giving her son a black belt after one day of karate lessons. I teach Kempo karate as a second degree black belt. I also have an assistant, Kira, a first degree black belt in her own right. The kids class I was teaching has just ended when a woman walks in with her son. 
she says her 13-year-old son wants to take karate lessons, so I shake hands with her and have her sit down with my instructor to fill out the waivers, and get him his GI measurements. Other students file in for the intermediate class and me and Kira get down to business. I take the bulk of the class, around 15 kids, while Kira goes with the new student one-on-one -on -one to teach him basic strikes and stances. Not five minutes later I hear Kira upset, telling the new boy to do 10 push-ups. Why? He called Kira, who's essentially a volunteer, a effing beach. Karen, the mother, stands up and says her son can't do push-ups, as she doesn't want her son to be sore. Kira lets him do the push-ups on his knees, but not five minutes later she makes him do 20 more, since he's now called her a useless dimwit. For reference, Kira is in her early 20s, and the boy is 13. Not to mention there's other parents and kids here as well. It's wholly inappropriate. So I walk over and ask Kira to switch with me. As she does, she gives me the bug eyes and mouths what the f? So I walk over and ask the boy why he insulted my assistant Kira. He said he doesn't like girls. When I asked him what he meant, he said he only listens to his dad or other boys. He won't listen to me at all. He needs some discipline. The mother confirms to me, chuckling. As if raising a monster is something to laugh about. When do I get a black belt like you have? The boy asks me. Mind you, he's been punching the air the entire time. This boy is aggressively hyper. Well, it takes quite a while. I've been training since I was five, and earned my black belt at 21, so it took me a while. I. Say. Nah, I don't want to wait that long. I want mine now. He says, his chubby face now red and sweaty from the shadow boxing. The mother motions me over and whispers in my ear. Do you think you could give him one? Just to make him happy? No sorry he has to earn one. We aren't a belt factory. Well he never gets told no. I'm sorry, but that's not how we do things here. I have money, I can pay you extra. No, sorry, we only give belts when they're earned. After several minutes of arguing and conversation that leads nowhere, Karen snaps at me. I paid you give my son a black belt. She stands up and points a finger in my face. It was so sudden that I reflexively took a step back. Hey, chill out lady. Some of the other parents chime in. Before I can reply to Karen, I hear a loud commotion behind me. I hear more parents and students shouting. I turn, and see a new boy laying hands on a girl in the class. Kira is shouting hey, stop. However, this girl that new boy is laying hands on is a purple belt. She loads a front kick and hits the brat boy center, right in his flabby stomach. He shouts and doubles over, now crying. I was so freaking proud of her. Hey that little beach hurt my son. Karen runs past me onto the mat and gets in the face of the 14-year-old girl her son just attacked. This girl is already scared and starts to cry but Karen ups the ante and shoves this girl in the chest with her hand. Kira gets between them and is red-faced enraged. I immediately rush over and try to defuse the situation but neither of them are having it. Parents stand up and start shouting. Keep your hands off my daughter. The girl's father, who was with the other parents, yells at Karen. He starts approaching aggressively but backs off when he realizes me and Kira, both black belts, are by her. Now, you should know something about Kira. She's under 5 foot, less than 110 pounds soaking wet, but she can still kick my butt up and down the mat on any given day. She's fast, accurate, and insanely flexible. She can control her body and perform techniques that I just simply can't. So Kira and Karen get into a shouting match with each other. I tell Karen to leave with your kid and don't come back. Don't you ever lay a hand on any of my students. Do you understand? I raised my voice, and was genuinely mad. F you. My son needs a black belt and you won't give him one. She screams at me. Your son is crazy. He attacked our students. Kira interjects, but this set Karen off, as she reaches and tries to slap Kira in the face. Big mistake. Having had enough, Kira parries the smack and fires an absolutely vicious kick right into the meat of Karen's inner thigh with nothing held back. It was glorious. Karen gasped as she fell onto the mat in a heap. Oh. Oh my god. She held her leg as the brat boy got up and rushed at Kira. I got in front of her and grabbed the boy's wildly swinging arms. I let him tire himself out. One of the parents called the police. After interviewing everyone involved, they determined that Kira and myself acted in self-defense. Neither of us wanted to pursue charges against Karen, but the parents of the girl Karen shoved rightly felt differently about it, so Karen was hauled away in handcuffs. Karen said she'd sue me and Kira in civil court, but since we have legal waivers, here's hoping nothing comes of that. My adultery ruined my life. I hate myself for it. I married my wife Annie 13 years ago. We dated for three years and tied the knot. Our marriage was great. We were really happy. Suddenly she becomes pregnant. I know it is our fault because we didn't use protection every time. We decided to keep the baby and our son was born. I thought our family was complete. But things drastically changed. My wife was always busy with our son. She used to be this fit girl who was always radiant. But she just looked like a zombie to me. She didn't care about how she looked while she was in public. I started to feel resentment towards her. Before I did anything stupid I talked to her and gave her an ultimatum that if she doesn't go back to her normal shape I would leave her. She started crying and saying that she is always exhausted and doesn't have time. I told her I would help her as much as I can but looking back now I did the bare minimum. The trouble came when she was again pregnant after 5 years. All the hard work she has done was down the drain. She gained a lot of weight. I avoided her. Just looking at her made me sick. I was either at the gym or at the bar. I was looking for excuses to not come home. That's when I met a girl at my gym. 
She was attractive and had a nice body. She was also younger than I was. We started talking. I felt alive again. I felt like there was someone here in front of me who appreciates me a lot. Few days later, I went to her house and we slept together. It was like a drug to me. I didn't realize that I was becoming more and more distant with my family. So, just like every cheater, I got caught. My wife found out that I was sleeping with someone else. She broke down in tears right in front of me. She kept repeating how could you do this to me? You broke our family. At that time, I did something bad. I am still ashamed of it. I yelled at her and called her a hag. I told her if she looked after herself I wouldn't have cheated. That it is all her fault. My wife started laughing. It confused me. She said if I helped her, she might have had the time. I was never home and outside sleeping with some random girl. She told me she wanted a divorce right there. I was really hateful towards her and said, fine, you can but you really think any man would ever want you with your baggage. I could see it broke her and crushed her. I wanted it at that time. The divorce was settled. She only wanted the house. We shared custody of the kids. The divorce felt a relief. I could be with my girlfriend whenever I wanted. But that is when I saw the changes. Whenever I was home, the house was not clean. There would be dishes in the sink for days. I remember looking at them and calling Annie but Annie didn't live in my house. It became tougher when it was my weekend to have the kids. I realized I knew nothing about my kids. My son was a picky eater. My daughter was still very little, she would cry a lot. It was exhausting. No matter how much I try my son would complain about everything and tell me that's not how his mother did it. That wasn't the end of the problems. Things with my girlfriend became bland way too soon. My wife would always have a home cooked meal ready for me. But my girlfriend is just happy to have leftovers or frozen pizza for all she cares. I was sick of it. Intimate life was also very boring. My ex-wife was really great at it. I never had any bad experiences with her. But my girlfriend lacked imagination. Also she has a really one-dimensional personality. My son really picked on things. He started resenting me. He was rude towards my girlfriend. My girlfriend would abuse him by calling him a brat. The last straw was when my son yelled at me and said that he hated me and my girlfriend would never be his mommy. It struck me like thunder. Things ended with her right there. On the other hand, Annie started to change a lot. She lost a lot of weight. She looked relaxed and like her old self. I once complimented her. That she looked good. I only got a cold, thank you back. I got to know from a mutual friend of ours that she would sometimes say that the divorce made her realize she deserved better. And things got better because she had some time for herself. Before that she had to clean up my mess and now there is hardly any mess left. I was hit with another realization that I treated her badly. I never helped her when she needed my help the most. Annie understood me. She was kind and passionate. She was just going through a rough phase and I kicked her to the curb. I went into depression. I asked Annie if she could give me a chance. She said no. I don't blame her. For my son, I got to know she started dating an old friend of hers. My son loves him, my daughter calls him Dada. I tried my best for my daughter to call me that, but she didn't. I met them together at a business convention. That man had his arm around my Annie and was showing her off. I was angry. I felt this rage inside me. Later that night, I drank a lot and started to call Annie. I spewed nonsense that her new boy toy is nothing but a weak man that is dating a pathetic single mom like her. I know this because the next day she came to my house along with my parents. My parents ripped me apart and said to stay the hell away from Annie. I lost my kids, my wife and I already lost my parents after the divorce. I never felt so alone. I wake on my bed empty. Annie would always cuddle me early in the morning. I missed her warmth. Things between my son didn't improve. He probably knows why me and his mother aren't together. Few months ago, Annie dropped a bomb. She said that she was pregnant. That was the moment I knew I lost her forever. From that moment, whenever I went to her house to get my kids, I would see how her boyfriend basically worships her and takes care of her needs. If I wasn't so stupid or arrogant and helped her, cherished her, we would still be a happy family. I guess this is my punishment. I have. To see another man play family with my Annie and kids. Who is that one stranger that you never forgot? When I was 15 years old, I ran away from home because I was pissed off at my parents for a reason I can't remember. I didn't have much money, so I decided to hop onto the Skytrain, public transport train in British Columbia, and ride it as far as it would go. I reached the end of the line in less than an hour, and decided I wanted to ride it all the way back again, while trying to formulate some kind of plan of how I wanted to live the rest of my life without my parents or anyone. At the last stop, or the first stop depending on your perspective of it, a girl came on and sat in the row right behind me. I didn't pay much attention to her at first, as I was busy writing my life plan on a napkin. It was a few minutes later that she got up and came sat next to me, curious as to what I was writing. I told her the story, and after a few laughs, we began talking about everything and anything. Her name was Amanda, 17 years old, and absolutely wonderful. She told me she was getting off at the last stop, which was also the first stop, depending on how you look at it. It was also the stop I had gotten on originally, and I told her we would ride to it together. The train ride took less than an hour, and what a wonderful hour indeed. When the last stop did come, we both knew we probably wouldn't see each other ever again, this was before the days of cell phones, and I was a shy little kid afraid to make moves. As we got to the end of the sidewalk which split in two different directions, she went right and I went left. Before saying goodbye she turned to me and asked me a question that has become a wonderful part of my life, she asked me, tell me something you have done, or want to do, that you think I should do? It can be anything, 
as challenging as you want it to be, or as easy. As long as you give me the rest of my life to complete it, I promise I will do it. I was confused as to why, but I thought about it, and told her, sing an a cappella song in a room full of strangers, she said perfect and asked me if I would like a challenge as well. I told her I did, and she told me, read, from start to finish, Ulysses by James Joyce. I had never heard of it at the time, but I agreed, and we said our goodbyes. I have an awful memory, and can't remember most conversations I have with most people. But I remember all of that clearly. You know why? Because of the challenge she gave me. In the 12 years that have passed since, I have tried to read that book in over 150 different sittings. Every time I open my copy of the 780-page monster of a book, I always think of her, and I always think of that day. I've never been sure if it was her intent or not, but she left her lasting memory on me with that challenge. I soon after learned what she did, was a completely wonderful and amazing thing for me. So I decided to keep it going. I've met a lot of strangers in my life, some that have become friends, and some, due to living in different time zones and whatnot, didn't. I don't want to just have experiences and then let them go. I want to remember these meetings, and embrace the fact that they happened. So whenever I leave someone who has left an amazing impact of my life, I always make sure to add them to my Ulysses bucket list. I ask them to give me a challenge, as difficult or as easy as they want it to be, and regardless of the fact that they have done it or not, simply something their heart has wanted to do. Some have been easy and fun. I met a man in India nine years ago who told me to, for a week or a month, cook and buy twice as much food as I intend on eating, and give the other half to a stranger in need. I completed that mission eight years ago, and thought about that man and the time we had all the way through. I met a girl on a cruise six years ago, who told me to jump into a body of water on a slightly cold day, without touching or feeling the temperature of the water first. I did that the very same year. I met a couple at an outdoor music festival a few years ago that told me to wear the most bizarre outfit imaginable and walk through a public place, completely oblivious to the fact that you aren't looking normal. I did that task the very next day, at the same festival. Some have been difficult, to say the least, three guys I met in Amsterdam and smoked all night with, told me to go to a mall and give 10 strangers 10 presents. That one took a lot of courage, but I did it a year or so after I met them. It was nerve-wracking, but at the same time exhilarating leaving my comfort zone. A girl I met on a plane told me to skydive, I'm still in the process of getting that done. A couple I met in Cali on the beach told me to tell the five people I hated the most, that I love them and respect them. That one was very difficult because of my stubbornness, but I've come close to completing that list many times. Still in the process, two more people to go. And some things, have had an everlasting impact on my daily life. I met a girl at a music festival, who told me that whenever I get mad at someone, walk away, sing my happy song in my head for five minutes, go back to the person I'm mad at with a clam heart in mind, and work things out. I've made this my way of life. I once met a man at a gym in a hotel I was staying at, that told me whenever your body and brain tells you that you are exhausted and done, use your heart instead and push out two more reps. I've made this my motto when working out or working on any kind of extenuating exercise in which my body demands me to quit. I also use it while working on anything, and while studying. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever received. There are many others that each brought joy to my life. There are still many tasks I have yet to accomplish, and every time I think of these tasks, I think of the people that gave them to me. It amazes me how well I remember all these people, while I can't remember so many aspects of even yesterday. These experiences, not only do I take from them a mission or a challenge, I also take from them a memory of them that never fails to appear inside of my mind. I opened my Ulysses book for probably the 300th time yesterday, and read a few pages, which prompted me to share this story with you today. I'm in the final 30 pages of the book, also known as the most dreaded of the read, in the last 40 pages or so, James Joyce doesn't use a single punctuation mark, no periods, no commas, no nothing, a straight 50-page run-on sentence. I never saw Amanda after that day, nor do I know if she ever did get a chance to sing a song to a room full of strangers. But what I do know, is that she gave me a gift that has never once stopped giving. So wherever you may be, thank you for giving me the Ulysses bucket list. And I swear I'll finish it one day. My life advice? Simple, create your own Ulysses bucket list. I adopted the best stray cat ever. He gave me tapeworms and almost unalived me. In January I adopted an 11-year-old chonker of a cat. I fell in love instantly. Early February, he starts coughing and stops pooping in his litter box, despite me cleaning it daily. He's still peeing in there, but seems cautious and runs out immediately. Even when he started pooping on the floor he'd run under my bed from it. That was the only time he'd go under my bed, otherwise he was cuddled up on or next to me. His medical chart from when I adopted him said he had issues with litter box pooping, but something didn't add up. He was fine with pooping in the litter box for the first month after his kitty enema. I cleaned up his poop every other day and saw nothing out of the ordinary. He was starting to lose weight, which was good because as cute of a chonker as he is, it's not healthy. I stopped free feeding him, started feeding him scheduled wet food meals, and we had daily playtime to get him to a healthy weight. I brought him into the vet in February for the sixth time in a month and a half. He had half of his teeth removed before I adopted him. This resulted in an incision infection and an enema due to medication constipation. This visit was for his cough. I even asked if he could have worms. The vet tells me, I know you're trying to be a good pet owner, but he likely has allergies and it's a behavioral issue. This might be something he has to live with. Come see me if his mucus turns brown. I had been right about every single doctor Google diagnosis up until this point, but whatever. I buy an air purifier, vacuum and clean regularly, change the bedding weekly. Despite the cleaning, 
Some coughing days were better than others. All of a sudden at the end of last week, he started coughing a lot less, and I started feeling like absolute crap. My best friend even makes a joke that I caught whatever my cat had. Sick sick foreshadowing. I woke up Monday morning to the pungent smell of my cat's. Usual poop surprise on the wood floor. He's such a kind cat to poop where it's easy cleanup. That's when I see them, worms crawling around everywhere. I'm gagging, take a little sample for the vet and flush the rest. I doctor Google the crap out of it and it is for sure tapeworms. Then I read about the eggs. I run to inspect my bed, there are eggs everywhere. Little rice demons of hell that have been dropping from my poor cat's butt for three months. I'm dry heaving at this point. I live in an old studio apartment and my bed is against a brick wall, so I get little grout crumble patches that I have to vacuum up pretty regularly. I remember feeling little patches of what I assumed one night was grout in my sheets, but fell asleep wine drunk and ignored it. When I tell you they were everywhere, I mean they were everywhere. My pillow, under my pillow my cat and I fall asleep cuddling every night. Again, I love this cat too damn much. I call the vet and it is undoubtedly tapeworm. We suspect he's had it since I adopted him. His prescription gets to me within a few hours. I also get flea medication and spray. I check him for flea dirt regularly and hadn't seen anything, but better to be cautious. I bag all of my bedding, throw out half of what I own, vacuum every inch of this place for an hour, I'm on the floor with my flashlight and find a dead tapeworm under my couch, Swiffer, disinfect my couch, flip my mattress, like total mental breakdown. I give him his medication and his cough stops instantly. He hasn't coughed once since Monday. I look in the toilet bowl to find three long strings floating on the sides that normally I would have flushed to sewage heaven without second thought, but they are undoubtedly tapeworms. My groan butt calls my mom and sobs while still sitting on the toilet in all of my wormy glory. I call and embarrassingly show the doctor, the doctor undoubtedly tells me I too have tapeworms and writes me a prescription. He asks me if I want just tapeworm. Or a foldy worming? He explains you'd be surprised how many parasites are living in you regularly. Just wait and see what you're about to poop out. I honestly just want to die at this point. My cat and I are prescribed the same medication, obviously just different doses and different price tags. His was $13 for two doses. Mine? $130 for one dose. That's with my last month of insurance from my previous employer. I immediately receive a text that my prescription is on back order. I'm trying to fall asleep that night on my couch without any blankets, when would you guess it my heat stops working? So now I'm just shivering on a small couch knowing there's worms crawling around inside of me and eggs everywhere. I don't sleep. I call the pharmacy when they open in tears asking when my meds are going to get there. Lucky me, they had just arrived. He asked me, did you know your prescription is $130? I'm like, uh no I've never had tapeworm, but I guess the price is irrelevant. We both nervously laugh. I pick up my prescription, light a candle, call my best friend, we have a little virtual funeral for my worms and try to make light of the situation. I play the song I want played at my funeral. But it just keeps getting worse y'all. My best friend hesitantly tells me he was telling his physical therapist about my worm saga. She recommended buying clove oil and rubbing it on my back entrance. I'm like why? Apparently worms like to bite your butt on the way out, and clove oil prevents that. I hate everything at this moment. It's like the different levels of hell. I take the pills and am reading the prescription pamphlet. It notes that you'll experience random aches and pains while the worms are dying. Let me tell you I felt every effing worm dying as I lay blanketless on my couch in the fetal position. All of a sudden, I'm thinking about the worms and I can't breathe. My throat is kind of itchy, and I'm thinking there are worms dying in my tonsils at this point. I'm laying there in the fetal position, telling myself it's just a panic attack. My cat decides to go pee at 2 a.m., jumps out startled trailing pee all over the apartment. I know the medication says limit your alcoholic beverages, but I say F it and make a drink. I clean the pee and finally fall asleep for about three hours. I wake up bright and early to the smell of cat poop. Still half asleep, I searched his normal spots and couldn't find any poops. He left it in the tub for me, a new spot, thanks cat. Easy clean up and no worms, I take it as a win. I flush it down the toilet, bleach the tub, and obsessively wash my hands. I look at myself in the mirror while scrubbing my raw hands and holy crap. My face is swollen to the point I'm still surprised I can see out of my eyes. My tongue is flopping all over the five place. I am having a severe allergic reaction to the tapeworm medication. That panic attack while falling asleep was actually an allergic reaction. I immediately video chat my doctor, he tells me to go get Benadryl immediately and writes me a steroid prescription. I get a call from their finance department on the brief walk to the pharmacy, $140 for that 5 minute virtual visit. I try to dispute the charge, she can't do anything. I just flat out ask her, can I just tell you about my crappy life then for $140? We talk for 5 minutes about how much my life sucks and she agrees. She was very nice about it, but still $140. She basically tells me that if I had waited a month to get a tapeworm and almost die from the medication, the virtual visit would have been cheaper without insurance. Effing love it in American healthcare. I cut my losses and went back to the same pharmacy from the day before and they asked me what's wrong. I lift up my glasses and they were like did you know you were allergic to this medication? At this point, I'm like why do any of you think I've had tapeworms before? Truly, complete mental breakdown. I buy my medication, a box, of wine, and $20 worth of candy to ease the pain. My great-grandmother is embarrassed by nightmare stepmother in her will. My stepmother did not take this kindly. Plus update. My great-grandmother and I were very close. As I grew up, her home was always a sanctuary away from my dad and stepmother's bullcrap. 
As a side note, I effing hate my stepmother with all my heart. She had made fun of my autism, made fun of mental health issues of basically any of our family members. When my younger sister came for help from her father, my stepmother literally assaulted her and told her to never show her face again. She loves to shove her political conspiracy theories down your throat and once she effing ate my custom made birthday cake the night before my birthday after coming home drunk from a night out. Enough about my stepmonster, as far as my great grandmother, she was also always very kind to my mother, even after my mother remarried, and at one point called the police on my father when he tried to lay hands on my mother when he found out she was going to remarry. The last year of my great grandmother's life, she seemed to just deflate. My great grandfather, her husband, had been dead for almost 12 years at this point, and I knew she missed him terribly, but that last year she seemed to talk about him more and more, and she lost a lot of weight, but never her mental acuity. One day, out of the blue, she calls my grandmother, her daughter, and asks for a ride she has to an appointment. My grandmother obliges, and great grandmother gives her an address, to a hospice. Turns out she had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer six months before, and decided it was her time, rather than fighting it. She didn't tell anyone because she didn't want us to try to talk her into chemo and such when she was nearly 90. She passed very quickly after she entered the hospice, and meeting up for the funeral was the first time I'd seen my stepmother in person since I graduated from high school. I avoided her, and spent most of the time talking. To my grandparents and my aunt. Even my mother came to the funeral, and I could tell she was very distraught about my great-grandmother's death. It was a lovely service in her tiny Methodist church, and then she was buried next to my great-grandfather in the nearby cemetery. My grandmother asked everyone to stay in town while she handled the will, and then we'd separate everything out. I told her I couldn't afford to, but I wasn't working at the time and she offered to let me stay at her house. My great-grandmother's house was locked up like a vault. My grandmother, probably in a blessed moment of foresight, hired security to watch over the house and its possessions 24 hours a day, and wouldn't you know, every day they had to report a redhead in her mid-thirties tried to go into the house and they had to turn her away. About three weeks later, my grandmother called everyone together at my great-grandmother's house to handle the will. Please friends, line the llamas up to the left, yourselves to the right, and snacks will be handed out in an orderly fashion. My grandmother decided to do a reading of the will. I am about 100% sure, this was because her own llamas were nearly starving from three weeks of laying low, and they desperately needed to be fed. Attorneys don't normally do readings of the will like you see in movies, so my grandmother read it, but my great-grandmother's attorney was there, with a box, that was to hand out things from my great-grandmother's safety deposit box in the bank. The will was organized by generation, to my grandmother, the house and whatever remains of her possessions and money after everyone else listed has received theirs. To my great-uncle, my great-grandfather's personal effects, like his watches and cufflinks. To my aunt, my great-grandmother's antique sewing machine that she'd inherited from her mother, and a lot of her vintage designer dresses. To my aunt's husband, my great-grandfather's classic car. To my uncle, there. Summer home by the lake. To my uncle's wife, my great-grandparents' books except the cookbooks, and the bookshelves to keep them in. To my dad, my great-grandfather's golf clubs, pipes, and camera equipment. To my father's wife, also known as my stepmother, one dollar with a notation that she never forgave her for the way she treated her precious great-grandchildren, and that she will enjoy watching her burn in hell, even if it means great-grandmother is condemned to hell herself for such vindictive thoughts. I think my grandmother was fighting off a smirk the whole time she read that. It was taking all of my self-control to keep my butt effing silent. Thank God I had tissues so I could pretend I was crying into them while laughing silently. To my father's first wife, my mother, $250,000, plus whatever is needed to pay off her house and student loans. Y'all, my mother wasn't even at this meeting. My stepmother started screaming. Insisting that someone had tampered with the will. She's not family. My grandmother looked at her with that 1,000-yard stare and said, Neither are you. My dad is beat red, but my grandmother has always been able to at least keep him quiet. After a few minutes of yelling, my grandmother told her to sit down and shut up, they weren't done. To my great-uncle's son, my great-grandfather's boy's cabin, and all the contents. To my aunt's children, a trust fund to pay for college, each. To my uncle's stepson, who he always treated like his own son, a trust fund to pay for college. To my younger sister, a trust fund to pay for college. To my younger brother, $250,000, and an heirloom necklace to give to his wife if he ever marries. To my younger brother, my mom's child with my stepfather, a trust fund to pay for college. To me, $250,000, her jewelry box and its contents, her cookbooks and the contents of her kitchen, and a letter. To my brother and I's children, should we ever have any, a trust fund to pay for college. If we reach the age of 45. Without children, the trust fund is to pay out our share of its remaining sum to us. Followed by a notation that if anyone can test the will they get nothing. Update 1. So after being heavily embarrassed at her reading, my stepmother was irate. But the will was not done. Now onto the letter my great-grandmother left behind. My grandmother looks over at me and says, I'm sorry, I read the letter to you before I read the will, do you mind if I read it aloud? My stepmother is already hopping mad, insisting that it's not fair, she's going to contest the will, my great-grandmother wasn't in her right mind when she wrote it, etc. My great-grandmother's attorney was right there the whole time, just rolling his eyes. I gave my grandmother the go-ahead, because about 20 years of vindication tastes like effing fine wine. The gist of the letter was, she is sorry she didn't tell me about the cancer, but she didn't want to worry me about something that is just a natural part of life. She is sorry that I drew the short straw when it came to parents, but is very proud of me. That my stepmother is a homewrecker and not to let her touch a cent of my money, no matter what my father says. That she hopes I'll use some of the money to get the mental health help that was denied me in childhood because my father is more concerned with his idiocy than his daughter's welfare. 
that my stepmother was evil and vindictive and she knows that she blew up after hearing the will and is now laughing at her in her grave. That one was badass, badass great grandma, badass. You could have heard a pin drop in that room after my grandmother finished reading it. After a few minutes, my stepmother sputtered, you can't let her do that. My dad just grabbed her arm, and the two of them left. As soon as they were out of the door, my brother looked at me, and said I'd high five you but that seems crass. And the rest of my relatives started laughing. According to my little sister, my stepmother yelled a lot about how they needed to contest the will, and finally my father shut her up with, I've divorced better women for less. That's enough. Which is an effing sick burn because my mom was his only other wife. My mom broke down in tears when we showed up with my great grandma's attorney to handle paying off her bills and give her a fat check, and then started full on ugly crying when they told her a trust fund had been set up for my baby brother to pay for his college. She didn't realize my great grandmother thought so highly of her, and the money wiped out all but a few credit card bills overnight. Plus, knowing she didn't need to save for my little brother to go to college made her life so much easier. As for me, I got the mental health help I needed. I used a significant portion of the money to pay for college once I was stable, got a nice job working from home, and used some more to move to Southern California since I have seasonal depression and not having a real winter helps a lot. Try to be lazy and get me to do your job, I'll let you fail. This happened two decades ago. Some background, my first job was at a fast food chain. I worked hard, impressed the store manager and got myself promoted. At the time, I was still 17. So, I was promoted to team leader, with implication that I would get promoted further when I was older. I was still in high school, so I worked the evening shift which started at 4 and ended at 12. The evening manager was a good guy who also worked hard and as a result had gotten promoted to a store manager position at a different location. Since they needed a manager, and I wasn't old enough, they hired a new manager who I'll call Karen. So Karen is hired and starts shadowing the current night manager learning the ropes. After two weeks, he departs and she is now set take over. That's where this story really starts. I normally get in around 30 minutes early. One of my responsibilities is to make a position chart, which tells the workers where they are working that night. I need to hand it off to the manager for approval before posting it. As I arrive, I notice one of our night shift workers is already there. We'll call her Jen. She is sitting in the lobby crying and being consoled by other employees. I always found her to be a bit manic, but she was a nice girl. She had a rough home life, so I didn't hold it against her. Come to find out she had just had a large fight with her mother, which ended with her getting kicked out. So, she is effectively homeless. Good reason to be upset. I ask her if she needs the night off. She says no, she needs the money. I can't disagree and head off to get started. For the night shift, the night manager typically runs the drive through register after day shift leaves. There are a few reasons for this. First, this means that the manager has control of the drawer, and money, for the entire night. This eliminates the possibility of employees having short drawers. Second, this also puts the manager as the person interacting with the customers. I lived in a college town so drunken guys drive through all the time and just want to chat up the pretty face behind the register. Third, it gives the manager the least amount of responsibilities as far as cleanup. So, given what I now know, I make up a position chart and place Karen on the register and Jen on a fryer where she can get help if she can't focus. I walked to the office to hand off the chart to night manager and was surprised that he wasn't there. He normally is in at least an hour before shift to make sure everything is ready. That's when I remembered, this will be Karen's first night alone. I groan inwardly. This is gonna be a trial by fire kind of night. The day manager is there but no sign of Karen. It's now 10 minutes to shift and even day manager is wondering what's up. I fill day manager in about Jen, show her the chart and ask if it looks good. She agrees, and I said I'll post it for now and Karen can sign it when she gets in. I had just finished posting the position chart when Karen shows up looking frazzled. She heads for the office without a word to anyone. Meanwhile people start getting into position and ready for the shift. A few minutes later Karen walks up, pulls my position chart and replaces it with a new one. Again, she walks off without a word. According to the new position chart, Jen is working the drive through and Karen is working. Nothing. Her name isn't there. She has another employee working two positions and the whole shift working effectively one person short. What? I head to the office where Karen and day manager are talking and ask for some clarification. I explain there must be a mistake. Karen, no, that's right. Me, but you're not in a position and worker is working two positions. Karen, well how am I supposed to be in charge if I'm in a position? Day shift and I just stare at her blankly. Day shift, you need to be in position. You are accounted for in the labor. Calculations. Karen, well, I have six years of management experience and I have never needed to fill a position to get the job done. Things are gonna change around here. We do things my way now. Now, she just spent the last two weeks shadowing a manager that walked her through every step of the job. She knows she should be in position and why. This shouldn't even be a question. She just wants to spend the shift sitting in the office and everyone knows it. At this point, day shift manager and I are sharing horrified glances at each other. I tell Karen that she'll need to go get people moved around if that's what she wants, because it's her plan. She gives an exasperated sigh and heads that way. I turn to day shift and plead with her to call the store manager and let her know what's going on. She agrees. I head back to the line and start working. After short time later, day shift pulls me aside and says that the store manager said it is Karen's shift, she is in charge. She makes the decisions. Then she leaves for the night. The shift proceeds to implode in a spectacular fashion. Less than an hour in, the employee working two positions is so far in the weeds that orders are taking three times as long to get out. 
The drive through is backed up and the guys stuck at the window waiting are trying to flirt with Jen, who is having none of it and getting more annoyed by the minute. As the wait gets longer and longer, the people are becoming more and more irritated as they get to the window and they are taking it out on Jen. Things are starting to get out of hand and Karen is nowhere to be seen. I go to the office to let her know we need help and find her watching a portable TV. I start to tell her what's going on and she cuts me off. She tells me get back on the line, do my job and stop bothering her. I was about to try and explain when I just thought, you know what, screw that. Hugh malicious compliance. I turned, walked back to the line and watched the situation unfold. 30. Minutes later, a car at the window is giving Jen an earful about how long she has been waiting. She calls her worthless and Jen goes off. She takes the large strawberry milkshake next to her, chucks it at the lady and calls her a fat ugly C word. The lady and the inside of her car are covered in pink goo. Everything went so silent you could hear a pin drop. Then the lady starts screaming. Jen closes the window on her and walks calmly to the back. The lady peels around the front and comes in the front door screaming for a manager. I go and knock on the office door. Karen appears looking pissed and annoyed. She tries to snap at me, but I tell her she has a customer at the front asking for the manager. Karen rolls her eyes and heads towards the front, oblivious to the storm that is waiting. I went and found Jen huddled in the back crying again. I tell her to get herself together and head back to the front when she is ready. I head to the line where the now purple-faced lady is screaming at Karen about dry cleaning and upholstery cleaning and I want that girl fired. At this point, I can see that Karen has finally realized that things have gotten way out of control. She is trying to calm the lady down, but she is having none of it. Eventually, Jen comes back to the line and lady starts in on her again, calling her all kinds of nasty things. Karen just stood there and let the woman berate her. Jen just kinda deflated in front of us. Watching her crumble like that just broke something in me. I walked over to Jen and said, just quit. You're better than this job. And you can do better. She looked up at me for a moment, then smiled. She lifted her chin, walked to Karen said I quit, handed her name tag to her and walked out. Karen started apologizing to the lady who now seemed slightly mollified. Then, Karen started bad-mouthing Jen to her. Saying how she was a terrible employee and how we were all happy she was gone. That's when I decided I was better than. That job, too. I looked at Karen and said, the only terrible employee here is you. And I walked out. Two other employees walked out right behind me. We all met with Jen in the parking lot and went to an IHOP where we sat and speculated on how Karen was getting along. Jen told me that was the first time in her life anyone had ever stood up for her. The next day, I got a call from the store manager asking for an explanation. Apparently, Karen had struggled the entire night with service. Afterwards, she had been there most of the night trying to clean and prep for day shift and had done a piss poor job. The story she had given the store manager was that Jan and I had planned everything with the intent to set her up because we didn't like her and wanted to see her fail. Karen had basically blamed the whole incident on Jan and I. The store manager told me she was investigating to get all sides of the story. So I told her. A few hours later, she called again and informed me that Karen was no longer employed and asked if I would be coming in that night. I asked if Jen was getting her job back. She said no. The whole shake debacle wasn't something she could overlook. I said then my answer is no. She was surprised. She tried to negotiate with me. I told her my price was Jen getting her job back. She said she couldn't do that. And that was that. If you're wondering how Jen turned out, I married her. We are very happy and have four children. My girlfriend cheated with my best friend, so I ruined both their lives at once. My wife Rachel and I grew up in a largish town of close to 30,000 people. We knew each other at an early age and we were practically inseparable. At 16 we started dating each other. When we turned 18, we moved away for work in a city just a few hours drive away. By 20 we were married and had bought our first house. At 22 we discovered that she was pregnant with a boy. About 5 weeks before she was due to go on maternity leave, a large shelving unit collapsed and crushed her. I was told that both her and our child were killed instantly. Two of her colleagues had also been injured in the accident, one left paralyzed, the other losing his leg after it had to be amputated. The company she was working for had decided to continue using old shelving that had been written off as unsafe instead of replacing it so that they could cut costs. I still haven't quite forgiven those executives and management personnel that made that decision, because they cut short my wife's life and unalived our unborn child. It wasn't long after I was told I had a choice on how to proceed with what her company called compensation, but I called it blood money. They wanted to settle out of court to avoid a lawsuit. I on the other hand was out for their blood. Fortunately, due to the media coverage that it got and the involvement of several politicians, the case was settled quickly in court and the payout for all parties was close to 10 times the amount that they had initially offered. A lot of fines were given to them for breaches on work, health and safety, executives were sacked and others were jailed. At this time, I was still working my job in telecommunications. My mother had moved in while all this was happening to help me. I think I would have fallen apart if she hadn't been as involved as she was. It was around this time that I was offered a promotion, but it involved a lot of travel around the state. I made a request to have an office in my hometown's branch, as I wanted to not only take care of businesses in the state, but also in my hometown, as there was no business representative located there to which they agreed. After a few months, we settled into a routine of one to two weeks in the city office, one week in my hometown and one to two weeks visiting the rest of the state. After a year, I decided to buy a house in my hometown so I wasn't having to stay at my parents' place every week and that I could come and go as I pleased. It is about four years later that our story begins. I had just returned from one of my trips on Friday, and was checking in some stuff at my office when Harry, the branch's managing director, walked in. 
We had grown up together too, but had gone to different schools, since coming back we had developed a very close friendship. He asked how things were, and then asked me if I wanted to come to a house party that he was having that evening. Short notice, but I said yes. I felt like a few drinks with friends were in order. It was there that Harry introduced me to Catherine. She was a new hire at the branch where my hometown's office was located and was getting to know everyone being new in town. We hit it off immediately. As much of a cliche as it sounds, it was almost as if my old wife was in front of me, instead of Catherine. I won't bore you too much with the details, but after two years of dating, we decided to take the next step and she moved into my hometown. Everything up to this point had been going really well. Catherine and my parents got along and Rachel's parents also approved and were happy that someone could make me just as happy as Rachel had done. All was going well for close to a year when things began to change. Skype sessions were cut short suddenly, neighbors would tell me about how a car, described to me like it was Harry's, was always seen parked in the back alley near my house whenever I was away, and some clothes that weren't mine were in my wardrobe. All signs pointed to her cheating, but she said that nothing was happening. She said that Harry would come over occasionally to discuss business but never stayed the night. I chalked it up to me being paranoid and continued on as if nothing was wrong, but there was always this feeling that something wasn't right. It was close to six months later that I discovered that she had been lying to me. I had just finished closing a rather large contract with a new company and negotiations had wrapped up earlier than I had anticipated. So instead of sticking around for the next few days, I decided to pay for an early flight home and surprise everyone. Fast forward a few hours and I drive into my hometown and down the alley behind my house so that I could get into the house without being seen and surprise Catherine. Some part of me was also curious as to whether this mystery car was there. Sure enough, there was a car that was blocking the back entrance gate. I was confused for a moment wondering if it had just been a neglectful neighbor parking only to realize that it was indeed Harry's car. Pulling up behind his car, I got out and thought it was strange that he was there so late as she claimed that he always had left by now. As I approached the back of the house I saw something that made my stomach drop. In my kitchen, Catherine and Harry were going at it hammer and tong. I froze. Time stopped. There was my closest friend, having intimacy on my kitchen bench with my girlfriend. I didn't know what to do. So many questions were running through my head. Was this real or was I dreaming? Why were they having intimacy in my house? Feeling defeated, I turned and left without them seeing me. I sat in my car for what felt like an eternity. I was crying hard. But the sadness quickly turned into anger. The same kind of anger I felt towards those that were responsible for Rachel's death. I wanted to hurt them. As a pacifist, I don't believe in violence. It was then I knew I was going to punish them and destroy their lives. And what better time to start than now? I moved my car back up the alley, far enough away from my driveway that I could still see Harry's car, and then walked back to the gate where I could see into the house, and called her phone. They were still going for it when it rang. They both looked at the caller ID and did a double take when my name came up. I could see that she was considering answering it and they let it ring out. After a few moments they were back into it again and I dialed once again. This time she answered. As she was answering I hung up and made my way back to my car. As soon as I did, she called me back. She asked why I was calling as late as I was, and I told her that I was about 10 minutes from home and didn't want to scare her coming in. She, obviously, was shocked and acted happy that I was coming and the call ended very quickly after she said she was going to get up and get changed into something. I said bye and hung up. A few moments later, Harry came peeling through the gate and still half-naked, jumped into his car and took off like a bat out of hell. I smiled a little, knowing the fear that both of them would be feeling from being so close to being caught. I waited a few moments before turning my car into the same place Harry had been moments earlier. The night was fairly uneventful afterwards and it wasn't until after she was asleep that I got up and went to my office down the hall. I couldn't sleep. I needed to plan. And plan I did. Update, my girlfriend cheated with my best friend, so I ruined both their lives at once. My mother always taught me to be a pacifist and to allow cosmic karma to take its course. But on this occasion I decided that karma could use a helping hand. I decided to punish them separately but destroy both of them. I knew that Harry had a drug habit. Nothing major, but he kept it very private. I only knew about it accidentally after seeing some coke and we'd left out in his place but pretended I hadn't seen it when he had made attempts to cover it up. I began calling some of my more unsavory clientele and made a few discreet inquiries into obtaining some samples that they were willing to part with. A few days later, I had a decent enough stash for my plan to work. About a month later, I had friends, including Harry, around for a barbecue night. After making sure that I sufficiently liquored up Harry, I told him to stay the night and sleep it off. In the early hours of that morning, I took the drugs, and an assortment of my personal belongings, and placed them at various places around his car, with the biggest stash in his tire well. I was confident that he wouldn't find them over the few months as the rest of my plan took effect. I also placed some more drugs and personal items in his house after driving him home because he was still too drunk to drive. A few days later, I staged a break-in by smashing the back pane of my back door into my kitchen and leaving it open before heading back to the city for a flight. I had several messages the moment I landed. One from my clearly panicked mom, who had found the back door smashed open and had called the police, one from Catherine in tears, and one from the local police asking me to call. After returning all the calls, I informed the police I was away on business, and that I would be back the following week to talk with them. While away, I got Catherine to stay with my parents until after I got back and asked my dad to organize one of the local security companies to install cameras and an alarm system after getting the go-ahead from the police so as to not ruin the scene of the crime. After getting home, I did the usual my god I can't believe this has happened and why would anyone do this? Routine. After doing a thorough check of everywhere, 
Finding that the items I had taken were missing and filing a police report, I had the security company's rep talk Catherine and I threw how the cameras and alarm system worked. Then came the question I had been waiting for. The question of what happens if we are doing some business and don't want it recorded. She acted a bit shy asking this question. But I knew exactly the reason she was asking. He assured us that this was a question he got asked a lot, and we were shown on the home computer, if we wanted to be doing things without it being recorded, how to stop the recording for certain cameras, so that we could protect her modesty. As I was walking him out, I asked him if cameras were turned off, could a notification be sent out, just as a security precaution. He came back in and helped me through how to set up email notifications and left shortly after. Fantastic. All I had to do was wait. The following week, my company approached me and offered me a promotion to move back to the city and run the team that I was a part of, meaning I wouldn't need to travel as often and be in one location. Due to the success of being located in my hometown, they were considering having three to five representatives spend one to two weeks in the larger surrounding towns including my hometown as a part of my team. I said yes and began the process of finalizing my transfer, which would take about six weeks. Perfect. More than enough time to gather all my evidence. Upon getting back to my hometown the following week, I began to start the rest of my plan. I asked Harry to approve one week's worth of vacation for Catherine for two weeks. I wanted to send her and a friend or two away on a retreat before I made the biggest decision of my life for a second time. He jumped up and gave me a huge hug, congratulating me on being prepared to take the leap again. I hugged him back tight, but not the way I think he imagined it at the time. He agreed and blocked out the week for me. I asked him not to say anything to anyone, as I wanted to make it as big a surprise as I could. I knew that it would spread like wildfire around the office regardless, but that was my plan. That night, I told Catherine that I had booked her and two friends to go to a tropical spa resort, all expenses paid for a week. No questions asked, pick two friends, and come back to the biggest surprise of her life. She screamed like a kid who had just been told that all the candy in the shop was hers to have. I then told her that the following week, I was going to spend some time in the city, preparing for a large client who was one of my biggest accounts and I wouldn't be home until the Monday that she was leaving, so I wouldn't be able to see her. She seemed disappointed, but I told her it would be worth it when she returned. What I failed to tell her was that I had decided to take two weeks vacation on the other side of the country, mentally preparing myself for the shitstorm that was about to erupt the moment she stepped foot on the plane as well as enjoying my first stage of freedom. On Sunday two weeks later, I flew back and began driving home. Once getting there I did a quick pass by my house and sure enough, Harry's car was there. Like the first night I had caught them, I parked a little ways back, and checked the cameras. Asleep in my bed. No surprise honestly as I had recorded them constantly do this over the two weeks I had been away. I then made my first call to the police while blocking my caller ID. I told them that I was one of my neighbors and saw someone hanging around in their car in the alley behind my house and occasionally passing something. Through windows to passing cars. I said I was concerned that they were dealing drugs and were going to break into someone's property. I gave them his license plate and description. They said they would have someone there in a few minutes so I thanked them and hung up. I then called Catherine and told her I was about 10 minutes from home, and that I knew she was flying out tomorrow, but desperately wanted to surprise her. Looking back at the footage now, I laugh at the commotion that I am surprised I didn't hear. In a few short seconds, Harry was half-dressed and flying out the back door to his car. At that point, I couldn't have asked for a more perfect scene. As Harry was peeling away, one of the police cars rounded the corner behind me, saw Harry driving away fast, and gave chase. After pulling in, greeting an excited Catherine, and doing all the couple things, she fell asleep again. I, on the other hand, couldn't sleep a wink. The next day her and her friends were bundled into a car. After they drove away I had to wait a few hours, but I began to execute my plan. I called my friend who was a mover and apologized for the late notice but needed my place packed and moved on Friday. After agreeing on a time I told him that he would need to take certain boxes to a storage facility, which he said wasn't an issue. Then I began packing Catherine's belongings. Later that day, I got a call from the police for me to come and identify some property that they had apprehended from a suspect the previous night that fit the description of property I had reported stolen. I grinned to myself, happy that my plan for Harry had grown to fruition and replied that I would be there shortly to collect it. Of course, when I got there, some of the items were still unaccounted for, due to the fact that they must have still been in his house and they hadn't searched there yet. By this stage, the town was buzzing with news. Events in my hometown don't stay secret for long. Harry was disgraced and promptly fired for his possession of substances and stolen property, and our respective bosses on behalf of the company had extended a formal apology towards me during the week. That night I went to my parents' house and told both mine and Rachel's parents what had happened, omitting certain details, and that I was moving back to the city after being promoted, but Catherine wouldn't be a part of it. They were pretty upset initially that I hadn't let them know what was going on, but were happy that I was handling everything maturely and hadn't sunk to their level, though they didn't agree with ghosting Catherine. But after some drinks, laughs and tears, I went home. On Friday afternoon, after a busy week of organizing cleaners for the following week, the real estate to put my house on the rental market, and various other tasks at my hometown's office, I packed some things into my car, and drove to my parents' place and said goodbye before the drive. Before leaving, I went to Becky's house. Becky had been one of Rachel's closest friends growing up. She was the only other person who knew what was happening, minus the details about Harry. Without her help, I wouldn't have been able to organize everything as quickly as I had. I gave Becky a large manila folder with my gathered evidence of her cheating, as well as the letter and a few other legal documents from my attorney stating that she was ordered not to contact me, and the details of how to access her belongings located at the storage unit I had rented out. After a quick goodbye, 
I left and drove back to the city. On Sunday, I woke up to several missed calls, voice messages and text messages. Turns out, Catherine had come home early after being alerted to something being afoot in town, only to find an empty house and a for rent sign out the front. Freaking out, she had gone to my parents, who closed the door on her the moment that they answered, forcing her to call everyone until she managed to somehow be contacted by Becky and told that she had a package for her. I was told that she didn't take too well to that, as I fully well knew at that point from the numerous angry texts and voice messages from her accusing me of setting up Harry and being deceitful. My dementia brain mother-in-law fought me because I'm having a baby girl. She thinks I've cheated on my husband just because I had a girl. I am 26 and my husband is 30. Mother-in-law is 70 years old, she and my father-in-law had my husband later in life as a last chance to have a kid. My husband has a name like John William Smith for the name has been passed down for literally generations. I will also mention, as it's important there has not been a girl born on his side of the family in more than 100 years. There's a huge running joke that the men in his family cannot produce female babies. So fast forward to our wedding day in 2017. I've had a pretty good relationship with my mother-in-law up until this point. Wedding was great, a beautiful ceremony, funny speeches, everything was great. Really, until it's the end of the night and we are getting ready to go leave to enjoy our honeymoon suite and she looks me dead in the eye and says now go make us our, insert my husband's name, plus an extra Roman numeral. I nervously laughed and we departed. Well, ladies and gents I indeed did make a beautiful baby with my husband over those two weeks and who would have thought, a baby girl. Everyone was so shocked when we announced it was a girl, and most of the family denied it up until the moment she was born. That's when the horrible comments started. Whenever my husband isn't around, my mother-in-law and her family members will make snarky comments like I wonder where she got that nose, it's definitely not my husband's. For your information, my baby, as beautiful as she is is strikingly, obviously my husband's. She genuinely looks more and more like him as the first year has gone by, and even more so approaching too. Well, as it would happen we are now expecting our second baby. And, yep another girl. I begged my husband not to tell my mother-in-law the gender when we found out, as I just wanted to enjoy a bit more of this pregnancy before she ruined it. I had. Decided to keep the mean comments his mother made to me about our first daughter to myself, as she's old and in poor health, and I felt guilty about potentially ruining their relationship when she probably doesn't have many years left to be around. I figure I'll adhere that mother-in-law isn't dying or anything, she's just had extremely poor health her whole life, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, eats garbage constantly, drinks only diet coke, refuses exercise etc. I literally offered this woman water once after she almost passed out from walking 15 steps and she gagged and said that's disgusting, water makes me nauseous get me my diet coke. So anyways, he insists on announcing it at our next visit, and holy crap y'all. As soon as she heard it was another girl, tears welled in her eyes and she started shaking her head back and forth and sobbing. She then started yelling at me, called me a whore, and demanded I get out of her house. My husband immediately stands up and starts yelling at her, asking what her problem is, and that she needs to apologize to me and watch her mouth in front of her grandkids. She says through broken whales not ours. Not ours. Those five earls are not ours. She's a W word. A S word. My son did not make those jive earls. I start crying hysterically and pick up my daughter, who is utterly confused as to why daddy is yelling at grandma and mommy is now crying. My mother-in-law then looks at me and starts yelling I let you get away with it the first time, I took you and his family. I allowed my son to believe he fathered that brat but I will not allow it again. My husband is now effing pissed y'all. Something I should mention here is that while my husband prepared his whole life to having a son, he was thrown on his butt when our daughter was born. He never knew that he could love any girl in the world as much as he loves our daughter. He has made several comments over the past year and a half that he never knew how deep love could go before he held our baby girl. I can 100% assure you, that if he had to save me, our daughter, or his mom, he'd save our daughter 10 tenths times. He gets extremely pissed and starts screaming at her that she is out of line and how dare she call his daughter names. He then goes on to say that we are leaving, and until she comes to her senses, she will never see any of us again. She tried to say something more but he cuts her off and yells at her by the way mom, I love that little girl more than I ever loved you. As he is shuttling us out the door. I cried and cried and broke down and told my husband all the little comments she and her family have said to me when he's not around while we drive the two hours home. He was so angry at them all and has been amazing in comforting me through it. We went NC for a few months and everything seemed to be going great. We blocked her and father-in-law phone numbers and hadn't heard from them except through other relatives over Facebook. We either told them to not attempt to relay messages from mother-in-law or they would be blocked, or ignored them completely. Then, when I was nearing my due date, we decided to be the bigger person and reach out to her and father-in-law and offer them a chance to make things right. She whines and whines that she misses my husband and granddaughter. We agreed to meet for dinner at their house after a few weeks for a proper talk and apology from her. We agreed that our daughter should not be present so my sister was set to babysit her. We arrive, dinner is served and we are trying to make small talk when my husband is like yeah, mom. This has all been nice but we need to talk about what happened and the things you said last time we were here. I know, and you know that you owe my wife an apology. Mother-in-law then looks at my husband and says yes, do you have the test? My husband, what? Mother-in-law the paternity test. I am not apologizing until I'm proven wrong. And we. Both know I'm right. You cannot be the father and the fact that you have now apparently made two girls is ridiculous my husband what the heck is wrong with you I start to cry and go to get up to grab my things and go to the car. Mother-in-law oh no you don't she shoots up, rounds the table and grabs my shirt, then proceeds to scream at me how dare you try to run away from this, you're effing whore and you need to own up to this problem my husband screams at her to get her hands off of me, and starts to make his way towards us. She then decides that I cannot be allowed to leave at any cost with her son, so she slaps me as hard as she can across my face. 
I push her arm away from me as I let out a scream from the shock of being slapped. My husband then gets in between me and his mom and starts to scream at her. He tells father-in-law to call the cops right now. Father-in-law ignores him and tries to calm mother-in-law down insisting that we can deal with this. My husband is furious and I'm crying hysterically. He grabs my hand and we are making our way to the door when mother-in-law grabs a snow globe from a shelf and throws it directly at me and it hits me right in the back of my head. It didn't shatter or anything but it did end up hitting me on the base and cut my head open. I fell to my knees from the pain and before my husband can put together what just happened she is grabbing anything she can find to throw in my direction. I'm on my knees on the ground holding my head with one hand and my belly with the other, being almost nine months pregnant as a cascade of random items are being thrown at me. My husband is screaming at the top of his lungs for her to stop and she proceeds to try to get close enough to kick me as hard as she can. Thankfully, she is old and in bad health so she loses momentum quickly and as a last resort my husband pushes his mom and she falls back into a shelf by the front door and he rushes me out. I'm crying and freaking out and yelling she kicked my stomach over and over and he drives me to the hospital. I end up getting six stitches in my head and the being monitored in hospital for four days because she kicked my belly. The baby ended up being fine, and the hospital demanded we file a police report. We find out that when my husband pushed his mom into the shelf, she ended up breaking two fingers and is claiming the excessive force hurt her neck very badly. Father-in-law called an ambulance for her and she claimed that me and my husband assaulted her in her doorway after they refused to let us in for a free dinner. Cops showed up and took our side of the story and compared our own report that we filed once at the hospital. They told us that mother-in-law is demanding to press charges against my husband for assault, while we are pressing charges against her. So then my my husband gets arrested but then quickly released after father-in-law is forced to tell the truth and mother-in-law then gets arrested for my assault. Father-in-law is now begging us to drop the charges as no one was hurt, um what? I was effing hurt. And my baby could have been hurt, and that we are being cruel to lock up an elderly woman. He insists that we drop the charges, say it was all a misunderstanding and he puts mother-in-law in counseling. Thing is, because my injuries were documented in hospital, we literally can't drop the charges even if we were stupid enough to do so. Because it was filed through a hospital, there's no way it can just go away. We are currently at home waiting for baby number two to arrive, I am on a strict bed rest order and my husband has taken the week off of work to help pamper me and take care of our daughter. I asked my husband if once baby number two arrives, we get paternity tests for both girls to send to his mom in jail, as a huge you. He thinks it's a hilarious idea and thinks we should also make copies and send them to all the relatives who were entertaining his mom's craziness, along with a written letter saying goodbye. That none of them will ever see us or his daughters again, and that he hopes they're all happy knowing that they've ruined any chance they had to have a relationship with him, or our children ever again. We are so thankful that our baby girl is okay through all of this, and so, so relieved that we decided against bringing our older daughter to their house that night. We can only imagine what could have happened had she been struck with something. My due date is currently 8 days away and I have an appointment the day of to discuss induction if she hasn't arrived by then, and baby number 1 was a week overdue and I had to be induced last time. Update my dementia brain mother-in-law fought me because I'm having a baby girl. After my mother-in-law hit me while I was pregnant because she thought I was cheating, I did a checkup on the baby. Baby does end up being alright in the end, even after my mother-in-law kicked me a handful of times while I was on the ground. So, this is where it turns for the worst. We are home, and my husband has been a rock, very supportive and comforting to me the whole time, we went no contact with my mother-in-law and father-in-law and I genuinely thought he was on my side. I had come up with the idea to do paternity tests on our girls and send them to my mother-in-law to get back at her, and it seemed like a great idea. We got in contact with a lawyer and he suggested that we take the paternity tests through the court so we have it as evidence and then the results couldn't be contested as fraudulent slash fake. That sounded great, right? Well, over the next few days my husband got more and more depressed. He started trying to get me to entertain the idea of minimizing mother-in-law's actions, and chalking up her behavior to old age. While I am aware that she's older, she's pretty sound-minded. I told him that she will be getting full screenings for her mental health when we go to court, and that while yes, she's old, she doesn't get to assault me and accuse me of horrible things and use her age as an excuse. If she's found to have some mental issues going on then I can deal with that, but that doesn't mean I ever want to be around her or have her around my kids. A few days go by and I'm nearing my induction day because the baby girl isn't making her entrance, and I find out that my husband has been talking with father-in-law and mother-in-law behind my back. We get in a big fight and he tells me that he still wants his mom to meet her granddaughter, and that we can put this aside until the baby is here. Then afterwards once she's gotten to meet her we can resume the legal issues. I am crying at this point as I thought he was supporting me through this but in reality he caved in no less than four days to his mom. I reminded him that we have put in for a restraining order and no contact order and that he has now broken it by contacting them. His response? Well the no contact order is issued to you, not me. And the restraining order hasn't been approved yet, so mother-in-law can come meet baby girl number two before we get approved without breaking any rules. All I could do was shake my head and cry. I put my foot down and said absolutely not, and I couldn't believe he'd let his mom around me or the baby after she could have killed one of us. He said that I was overeating, as the baby was not injured and she wasn't actually trying to hurt the baby, just me. What? She kicked my very pregnant belly repeatedly after she threw a snow globe at my head. We got in a huge fight about me not forgiving her and holding grudges and being unreasonable and eventually he just left. Where'd he go? Yep, his mom's house is a few hours away. He then called me sobbing and told me that if I could see his mom right now I'd understand. Apparently when he pushed her while she was assaulting me, he indeed broke two of her fingers and she sprained her neck when she fell back into a shelving unit. She's laid up on a sofa in her living room, can't walk and in a severe depression. I should feel awful according to him. The least I could do is let her meet her new grandchild, and then figure out where to go from there. 
I'm so infuriated at this point, because not only has he retreated to his mom's house, he left me alone with our oldest daughter who is two, while I'm supposed to be in bed rest, with effing stitches in my head and an eight pound baby in my uterus who refuses to come out and I am so exhausted. He doesn't come home for the next four days until I'm supposed to check into the hospital for my scheduled induction. My sister comes to watch my oldest daughter and my husband takes me to the hospital for the induction. We get set up and they are poking me with things, shoving arms up where they don't belong, pumping me with pitocin and waiting to see if baby will come. He mostly sat in the room on his tablet, as I was admittedly pretty cold slash grumpy with him still and wasn't acknowledging him very much. Finally I started making progress with labor and things were going well, baby was starting to move down and I was nearing the point where I needed to push. He did end up putting his tablet away and trying to get more involved, and at this point I wasn't going to push the support away as I was literally trying to push a baby out of me with no drugs. Finally the baby started to crown and my husband looks at the baby's head, looks at the nurse standing next to the doctor and asks when do you do the paternity test? I stopped mid-push, looked at my husband and screamed what the heck the nurse was silent, looking back and forth between me and my husband. The doctor then looks at my husband and says sir, we are here to deliver and take care of babies, if you have other personal relationship issues, you need to figure that out afterwards. We focus on baby and mom, this is not the place to ask questions like that. I immediately start crying hysterically and babbling stuff like it's not like that it's his baby, his mom is psycho and stuff. I am so mortified at the thought that these nurses and doctor now think there's a chance my baby isn't my husband's and there's no way I can explain the situation to them. I immediately felt judged by the nurse and couldn't help but feel like I had been robbed of a beautiful moment. My mind completely shut down in the short time between crowing and when the baby comes out ended up taking an extremely long time because of how distraught I was. I was so angry at my husband. I asked him how could he do that to me, how could he ask that in front of the doctor and nurses when he knows it's his daughter in it. Was my idea to do the tests in the first place? After the baby came out, I just held her and she was beautiful and perfect but I was so distraught. I couldn't look at my husband and I hate to admit this but I wouldn't let him hold her. I was just so angry. He left and when he came back about an hour later he said that his mom wanted pictures of the baby and he took out his phone and I smacked it out of his hand. He got angry and left. My sister had to pick us up from the hospital and took us home two days later. In my state you have to take the baby back in two days after being home to do tests and a checkup to make sure baby is maintaining weight and that there's no obvious signs on neglect. So we took her in for the check and then went to a clinic to do the paternity test the same day. The next few days at home were awful. I can't even look at him, and he has avoided being around me or the baby for days. He barely has even looked at her, and is practically ignoring our oldest daughter. We got in a fight because I was trying to breastfeed the baby and my oldest daughter was crying because Netflix wasn't working and I started crying because I was so overwhelmed and he just looked at our daughter and said mommy didn't pay the Netflix bill because she's mad at grandma I yelled at him to not say crap like that to a child. He said he just thought I didn't pay it because his mom uses our account at her house. I just forgot to pay it, it had nothing to do with that. He made several comments to our daughter over the next few days like daddy's going to go see grandma, you can't come because mommy hates grandma. Then leave me with a hysterical two-year-old and a newborn. I'm not going to lie, I know that I'm dealing with crazy hormones and this is a horrible patch, but I seriously considered telling him I wanted a divorce right there and then. He left, I tried my best to cool off but I couldn't. I have actually convinced myself that I want a divorce over his. Behavior. Am I going crazy? Is this enough to seriously consider leaving him? We got the results for the paternity test three days later, and for anyone who ever doubted me, y'all can't ride with mother-in-law to crazy town. He's the father. He cried and told me he never doubted it and that he knew he was the dad. I told him that we would do a second test on our oldest daughter and that I was going to start packing our stuff and I was going to go move in with my sister. He bawled and bawled and said he didn't need one for our oldest daughter. I demanded we take one, as I would want it as proof for court whenever we get to have my case heard. I told him that I never cheated on anyone in my life including him and how much it hurt me that he said that in the hospital room and made the nurses and doctors think he doubted our daughter at all. He tried to apologize and hug me but I pushed him away and told him he should leave while I packed up some things. My oldest daughter, my baby and myself are now staying at my sister's house and he has told me that he refuses to take the second paternity test for our oldest daughter and is going to make his mom write out a very long apology letter to me. He wants me to come home but I just can't even look at him the same. I feel like all the love I had for him has been ripped away and I feel so angry towards him. I'm just trying to take care of our girls but he won't stop calling me. I told him he can see the girls anytime he wants but he can't take them near his mom and she is not allowed to be around them at all. I'm going to give myself a few weeks to sort out my feelings, but is this not enough to justify a divorce? I don't exactly want to go through with a divorce but I really just can't even look at him the same, and I don't know how I could ever get past this.